All right, it is six o'clock. We'll call this meeting to order. Interim superintendent, if you please call the roll. This is interim superintendent Lucci Garcia, President Holt. Present. Vice President Wedge. Present. Clerk Brickler. Present. Trustee Grigsby. Present. And Trustee Ross. Present. And I move that we pull items 4A and 5C before we move on to closed session. I'll second that. Oh, there's Trustee Ross. All right, we'll roll call all votes. Okay, so roll call for those. Uh, President Holt. Aye. Vice President Wedge. Aye. Clerk Brickler, aye. Trustee Grigsby. Aye. Trustee Ross. I heard, I saw that she was mouthing the word I. She, or they, looked, she mouthed I. Yeah. But yeah, she's on mute. Okay. Okay. So the eyes have it. All right. And with that, we are going to recess the closed session at 6.01. All right, it is seven o'clock and we're going to reconvene an open session here. And Vice President Wedge, if you would please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Yeah. Yeah. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Oh. Hmm. Right. And no action was taken in closed session. And item 5C was pulled. So moving to item 5D, I move that we approve tonight's agenda. I'll second that. All right. And everything's a roll call vote this roll evening. Vote. Okay. Um, President Wedge. Oh, sorry. President Holt. Aye. Vice President Wedge. Aye. Clerk Brickler, aye. Trustee Grigsby, aye. Trustee Ross, aye. All right, and moving on to item 6A, our ITS presentation. Director Peters will deliver to the board his yearly presentation on the ITS department. Good evening and thank you. President Holt, trustees, superintendent, 
Lucia Garcia, staff and guest. I'd like to share with you some of the changes we've been through in the past year and where we're headed. We look forward to changes. <clears throat> Sorry, we look forward to changes within our systems um, and adding related staff and cabled infrastructure. We will follow that up with physical changes and improvement. <laughs> Sorry. Should get tech guy on that. And we will continue uh, with uh, changes planned for future improvements. Uh, here we'll take a quick look at the updates to the team and the improvements at sites. I'd like to introduce you Jordan Shorkey. He comes to us with a degree in networking and technical support. With just three weeks in, Jordan is doing a great job, and we're very happy to have him. ITS has been working hard to improve Wi-Fi systems. We've been overseeing the installation of 47 new access points, 17 new switches, and a wireless bridge to connect portables at Auburn Elementary. This will improve and enhance systems so that every classroom has the ability to support all class sizes. New clock, bell, and public address controllers have been installed in all schools. This will improve bell schedule creation and alteration. It will be managed remotely and provide a solid modern infrastructure to improve on. We are now able to accurately address clock units that need replacement and add additional PA coverage for better improved safety. Our physical systems range <clears throat> from users themselves to the devices they use. Here we'll take a look at human firewall, customer relations and customer services. After re-implementing our previous phishing email training software, we have seen a great improvement in reducing the fish prone score of 27% to down to just 10%. ITS is stressing a goal of less than 5% and we will be, and with additional training, I'm sure that we can meet this mark by the end of the school year. ITS customer approach process works to solve customer problems and train in the same step. A minute of training will reduce hours of troubled calls over time and improve staff performance. We try every day to improve the tools and knowledge to set everyone up for success. We believe a happy customer will perform better. ITS wants to catch problems before they become problems. With advanced monitoring and notifications, we hope to solve issues before it impacts students and staff. We are working on ways to streamline sport ticketing process and uh, so that we respond and repair or repair within 24 hours with an overall average solution time of under 48. Here we're gonna look at some future systems already in the planning phase. ITS will work to simplify routine processes, utilizing automations and reducing steps in the process. ITS will work with any department that is interested in process improvement, whether it involves technology or not. This year we plan to find out, and, and this year we plan to find ways to implement and improve using tools we already have to improve our return on investment. One example, with this is more, uh, more implementation of single sign-on to improve security and reduce account management. ITS will continue to use tools like short videos, AI generated process plans to continue to educate staff and students so that they get the most out of the systems without being overburdened by long complex lectures. ITS would like to thank everyone for the opportunity we have been provided. Thank you. Mr. President, oh, thank you, Director Peters. And are there any questions on that? All right. And so just as a bit of housekeeping here um, for, for the board members, make sure we try to announce our name because um, we do have the interpreters working for us tonight. Um, Moving on then to item seven, um, public comment. 
So this section is for public comment for items not on tonight's agenda. So if your public comment is related to something that on this evening is on this evening's agenda, please wait for that agenda item to come up. Um, otherwise, I'm going to ask you to sit down. So we'll be taking public comment from seven, and then after that, if there's remaining public comment, we'll tag that on to the end of the tonight's evening, uh, this evening's meeting. So with that being said, moving on to public comment. Evie Kane History Team. Good evening. We are the Evie Kane History Team. Having just done a successful Renaissance Fair, I'm David Solomon, coordinator. This is Emma Costa, our community contact. And this is Brooke Weber, our financier. So we just had an amazing event in October for our Renaissance Fair. All of our seventh graders got to participate and immerse themselves in the Renaissance Fair. A lot of hard work went into the event. So I just want to thank you guys for those who went and got to see the success of the event for our students. And if it's all right, if we approach, we would like to present something for those of you that came and attended our wonderful event. Thank you for your time. Nicole Schichtel and Shirley Paris. Hello board, my name is Nicole Schichtel and I am one of our new service club advisors at EB Kane. In um, December, we will be having our hometown heroes um, luncheon to honor veterans. Um, we're focusing on firefighters this year and also any Auburn community members that help support our community. So we would like to formally invite you guys to have invitations for that. And good evening, board. My name is Shirley Paris, and I am assisting with the service club this year. And um, in addition to the Hometown Heroes Luncheon, which is a wonderful community event, um, Evie Kane is also participating in Wreaths Across America. And since you are all residents of Auburn, I would like to share with you that there are 2,400 veterans buried in our new cemetery in our old cemetery. And the Evie Kane Service Club has committed to selling 100 wreaths uh, as their goal for wreaths across America. So I have forms here, should you like to participate. I have flyers that I have given Kirsten for the district office. And I would like to formally invite you to the event, which is on December 16th, promptly at nine o'clock. We have the best event in town or uh, responding areas. We will have a flyover. We will have a class one bagpiper and the kids will be there to place Reese on our veterans graves. Thank you. We thank you for your time and um, like to remind you that the Evie King Service Club is certainly a club that is recognized throughout the community. So we hope to see you there. Thanks. Thank you. Jessica Spade.
Good evening, board, President Holt, Vice President Wedge, and Cabinet. Um, I just wanted to quickly, I don't have anything specific prepared other than I just wanted to say thank you. We're one of the families that went through transition this past year. I'm going to be honest, we weren't excited about it. We loved our little tiny Alta Vista community charter, and I drive past it every day on the way to school. Um, however, we're here now at Sky Ridge, and one thing that I tell my kids all the time is the only thing you can count on in life is change. Um, I don't believe change is always bad. It gives us an opportunity for growth and we're figuring it out. And I just wanted to give a shout out to the awesome staff, some of which is here from Sky Ridge. They're amazing. The PTC at Sky Ridge is amazing and well, well organized. They've held some great events already this year and um, just wanted to share my thanks um, to everybody who's making that happen. I also, while I'm here, because I'm here, um, wanted to say, ooh. I'd like one of your forms for wreaths across America. I've been there. I'll shout out to that. It's an amazing event. Um, and my sons were a part of a civil air patrol years ago and they got to place wreaths and it was beautiful and emotional. So um, I support that as well. Lastly, I also wanted to touch, I'm looking at my time here um, on K-8. Um, we came to Auburn district. I know Excuse that me. this is later. Excuse me. Yeah. So okay. I'm about to stop you there. If it's no problem. Touching. Thank you. No problem. Thank you. Yuretsi Soto. Dear board members, what you're about to decide is not okay. Every single school in the district K through eight, we can't even fit enough people at Auburn Elementary. Another thing I wanted to point out is lunch. I invite you to come and eat in the cafeteria because today I didn't get what I ordered because a few kids who didn't stick with their, what they ordered. You guys are not thinking about the children's mental health. You guys are just making decisions that just that's just causing more problems for the principal and teachers. I wish there were more advanced clubs for kids who want to learn more. My teacher is going to start a club that is about soldering. For our education, the, the team that you form gives us opportunities for our future. I hope you take an account of my opinion. Thank you. This is President Holt again. So moving on then to item 8A. Let's hear from the Auburn Union Teachers Association. Good evening, Board of Trustees and Interim Superintendent Lucci Garcia. Thank you to everyone here tonight who has taken an interest for our Auburn students. I came to you tonight with concerns on multiple levels about our schools. First, safety. We still have many classrooms without water, 10 to be exact. While the announcement to parents that was issued that everything has been fixed, we still have 10 classrooms that do not have either drinking water or water for washing hands. Students can't drink water and wash their hands. The water at Sky Ridge Playground has not been working all year. We've asked for bottled water, and when you receive a case of 24 bottles and you have 25 students, what are you supposed to do? The school board and the district management have had time and energy to close and consolidate schools, but not make sure that clean drinking water is available for students and staff. We have been bringing this to the district's attention since August. The letter that was sent out to parents and the community was inaccurate as all of our school sites and classrooms do not have access to clean drinking water and water for washing hands. It is now November. In the area of supervision of students and playground safety, there are areas that have been shut down on playgrounds due to not enough supervision. The entire playground gets smaller and smaller, so students have less space to play. 
the school board and district management is balancing the budget at the expense of students and staff. We are hemorrhaging teachers from this district. We lost a third last year and a third the year before. That's two thirds of our teaching staff in the past two years. All the layoffs that were, were given last year were rescinded. So anyone that wanted a job could have one. We still have openings in this district. The school board and district management are not prioritizing its teachers. Overcrowded sites, lack of professional respect and and adequate support are causing teachers great stress and flee our district. Teachers are being forced to choose between their family and their students. Educators are tired and exhausted, falling behind financially and being disrespected. This hurts their families as well. I ask the board to listen to the community as they are here to be heard. You should allow them to speak. Do your job that you were voted to do and listen to the community. Not seven statements or 20 minutes, but listen to everyone. I'd like to introduce John Halverson, who is a resident of Placer County and is our CTA staff person, who we have asked on behalf of AUTA to share our concerns about the transformation plan in going TK to eight. Good evening, trustees, superintendent. Um, like Sarah said, I'm John Howard. I do work for the California Teachers Association, but I am a resident of Placer County. My kids go to public school up in Tahoe, Truckee. And I am here at the request of the teachers, um, specifically at the request of Auburn Union Teachers Association, who is exclusive represent representative for them. And I just wanted to make sure that the community was aware of a letter that I sent out on their behalf to all of you earlier this evening to make sure everyone's clear on the record that um, we issued a cease and desist over the plan to go to TK-8, not because we're taking a stand at this point in time if it's a good plan or a bad plan, but the fact that the teachers, the um, exclusive rep has not been notified or provided any opportunity to consult or bargain the impacts and effects on that. So I sent the letter and it said, Dear President Holt, this letter is sent on behalf of the Auburn Union Teachers Association, CTA, NEA, AUTA, as an exclusive representative for the certificated teaching staff employed by the Auburn Union School District. I represent a AUTA. It has come to my attention that tonight on November 8th, 2023, the governing board of the Auburn Union School District will consider a plan to unilaterally convert AUSDs to only two elementary schools and only one middle school into three separate K-8 schools. Unilaterally freeze AUTA bargaining unit member salaries schedules and unilaterally impose three furlough days for AUTA bargaining unit members next year, which is included in the plan that you'll see tonight. The Education Employment Relations Act, EERA, requires the district to give reasonable written notice to the exclusive representative of the public school employers intent to make any change to matters within the scope of representation and provide AUTA a reasonable amount of time to negotiate regarding the proposed changes. I found out about this last week. Government Code Section 3543.2, subsection A3, the district's failure to give notice to AUTA of these changes is a violation of this provision of the collective bargaining law in California. Bypassing the exclusive representative, representative is a violation of AUTA's rights and obligations as the exclusive rep. As explained thoroughly in the EERA, AUTA has the right and the responsibility to represent AUTA bargaining unit members in all areas concerning employment related to negotiating wages, hours, and working conditions, as well as providing input through the legal consultation process and all curriculum and educational program decisions. The EERA further requires the parties to negotiate and consult in good faith at the bargaining table. The district's actions are viewed by AUTA as a violating the legal bargaining process required by the ERA. Specifically, it is illegal for the district to unilaterally implement a change like this and constitutes an unlawful violation of government code section 3543.5, subsection A, B, and C. The district may not implement these changes until it has given the association proper notice per the Educational Employment Relations Act and an opportunity to bargain over the negotiable effects. The association therefore demands that the governing board either reject the plans outlined above tonight or at a minimum postpone any action to adopt the plans until the district has compi complied with its legal duty to bargain. 
The board's adoption of a school conversion plan has negotiated negotiable impacts, including but not limited to workload, work year, salary, class size, transfer and reassignments, evaluations, curriculum, educational program changes, and more. The board's plans to unilaterally freeze salary schedules and unilaterally impose furlough days would also violate the Educational Employment Relations Act. The district has not given the association notice of this intent to implement these changes, and a board meeting presentation does not suffice, and an opportunity to bargain over those effects. There is no doubt that the proposed plan affects the terms and conditions of employment, and the district is not free to unilaterally implement any of these changes. The bargaining process is particularly important here where the plans are not straightforward. It will not be clear how the plans will be implemented. If the district were to unilaterally implement the proposed plans, AUTA bargaining unit members would be left unclear about their wages, hours, and working conditions. If the board adopts the plans before the district has compi complied with this obligation to bargain under the Educational Employment Relations Act, AUTA will be forced to file an unfair practice charge with the Public Employment Relations Board. The association is aware of other cases in which PERB has issued decisions against districts for violating the law when unilaterally freezing salary schedules for educators in California. AUTA urges the board to avoid unnecessary litigation by rejecting the proposed plans or at minimum postponing any action to adopt the proposed plans until the district has complied with its duty to bargain. Had AUTA received the legally required written notice from the district, the association would have demanded to bargain the effects of these plans before they were implemented but once the plans are unlawfully passed, the district must restore the status quo by rescinding the plans entirely before the association would agree to bargain its effects at the bargaining table after the fact, because that would put us at a huge disadvantage, would enable the district to benefit from its unlawful unilateral change and does not comply with the duty to bargain under the ERA. AUTA would be forced to file the unfair, as I stated earlier, against the district, asking PERB to order that the plan be rescinded and order the district to bargain with the association before approving it. If the district is serious about wanting to bargain in good faith and avoid incurring unnecessary legal fees, I mean, from a UPC, it, would be, it should follow the same process as required by the ERA. I want to stress, I don't speak at board meetings where my kids don't go to school very often. I know you guys have a lot of difficult situations that you're addressing. And I, I respect and honor that work that you have to do. Again, they're not taking a position on this, but they did ask me to make it clear that we don't want to go forward with something and then have to move backwards. We're already middle of the year. They need to focus on the change that's already underway. Consolidating schools was tough on everyone. They're making their best effort and making it work and making kids successful and thriving. But more change without addressing all of the things that need to be done ahead of time is counterproductive. Um, So I urge you to listen to this. I don't like to make these. It might sound like a threat, but it's our duty to bargain these things on behalf of the members. And also, I would urge you to hear the voices of the teachers. Without them, all of them here, that plan will never work. They have to make it work if that's what's going to be going forward. So you need to talk with them. I know last year with the consolidation, there was a committee that worked for a long period of time to try and come up with recommendations. And this plan, K-8, at the time was voted down. But this year, I've been informed no one, not one teacher, has been asked to provide input on how this would work, how it would affect students. And I can't imagine a school district making such a decision or a school board of trustees endorsing a decision when the teachers who will make that plan into effect have not been consulted. They're your experts. They love your kids. So please listen to them and rescind, don't vote in favor of this tonight. Thank you. All right, and CSEA, do you have a report for us this evening? Well, this is not easy to follow that. <laughs> Good evening. <laughs> Good evening, members of the board and uh, our superintendent. I have the following concerns that classified members have shared with me recently. Um, the faucets and the lack of water in the rooms, broken copy machines, running out of paper to copy things that need to be copied when the machines are working, 
curriculum that's not able to be provided and workbooks that we have to copy, staff shortages, and just feeling like there's not enough hands to get the job done. Chaos and disorganization that's affecting students and staff, needing more support for students and teachers, and the low pay. These all affect morale and add stress to the jobs that are already packed, and more and more is always being added to our plates with not extra time to get it done. We need more staff, more hours, and a living wage compatible to the surrounding areas. Thank you. All right, and moving on to comments from the board and superintendent. Good evening. AUSD has reached an agreement with AUTA regarding their class size grievance, closing out negotiations for 22-23. This significant step forward demonstrates our shared commitment to creating an optimal learning environment for our students and a manageable workload for our teachers. This agreement will be brought forward for voting at our next regular board meeting. Um, next, I'm, uh, I'm thrilled to share some exciting news about our AUSD family. Please join me in extending a warm welcome to our new vice principal, Katie Bansomer. Katie brings a wealth of experience and a passion for education that aligns perfectly with our district's mission. We are confident that her contribution will greatly enrich our community. Finally, I'd like to express our profound gratitude to Trustee Grigsby, for her exceptional effort in arranging a donation of approximately 60 cases of water from the Placer Food Bank. This generous contribution will significantly benefit our schools and reflects the spirit of community support that makes AUSD special. In our united journey as a district, we are putting forth our best efforts to navigate our budget reductions together. This path requires understanding, compromise, and a bit of sacrifice from everyone all with the shared goal of nurturing and investing in our students' futures. Thank you. Excuse me. So, uh, good evening, Ms. President Holt. Uh, first, I'd like to address uh, the cease and desist letter that was sent at 5 p.m. this evening. Um, if the board determines to move to a TK-8 model, absolutely this will impact and affect the working conditions of some teachers. This sequence of events, though, for bargaining is the board acts, then the district provides written notice to AUTA of intended changes for August of 2024, then the parties would have approximately nine months to bargain about those implementations. So we're not skipping bargaining. Um, regarding the furloughs and step and column freezes, well, those just aren't on this evening's agenda. So I'm not sure where you heard that, but that's not the case. Um, those were, though, discussed at our August board meeting. Um, as proposals put forth by the interim superintendent. Um, specifically, those were uh, stated that those would be items that would be negotiated and bargained. So uh, again, I'm not sure where the, 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 the anger is on that one. Uh, I'd like to continue addressing some of these issues that were raised tonight. Excuse me, please keep it down. Thank you. So, uh, uh, let's see, President Sarah Liebert, you asked why the school board and district management has the time and energy to close and consolidate schools, to, but not to make sure that clean drinking water is available for students and staff. Your premise is simply false. Before I describe what actions our district and schools have taken, okay, excuse me, if you're going to speak up where we can't hear, you're, you're welcome to step outside. Thank you. So before I describe what actions we've taken, I'd like to clarify what's legally required. According to state and federal regulations, public K through 12 schools have a requirement to provide clean, potable water when and where meals are served. Pulled this straight from CDE's website. You're welcome to go find it. Not only do each of our school sites provide water at mealtimes, but we have drinking fountains throughout campus. There are many classrooms have drinkable water in the classrooms, and there are plans to install the bottle filling stations. When school started this year, one classroom at Sky Ridge, one classroom at Auburn Elementary, and one room that was used, and one room that's used for one-on-ones did not have running water due to the fixtures. Several others had classrooms that uh, several other classrooms had sinks that weren't for drinking water, pending flushing and testing. 
flushing and testing that all came about from early last year when it was identified that once one fixture at Alta Vista tested high for ele or tested for elevated lead levels. After that, the district tested all the sites, all the different fixtures at Alta Vista, and went on to test all the sites throughout the district. If you go back and watch the notes or look at our March of 2023 board meeting, we discussed some of that happening then. So this is something we've been working on. So although it's far beyond the legal requirements, the district has provided bottled water to impacted school sites for the principals to distribute as the principals saw fit. Since school started in August, the district and local partners with donations um, have provided over 2,300 bottles of water to administrators at the sites. Recently, Auburn Elementary refused 30 cases from the 60 cases that were offered from the food bank. The suggestion that water in our school, that our schools don't have water or that the water is unsafe is a lie. It is a lie. Okay, so ma'am, excuse me. Thank you. On August 24th, CBO Heather Leslie sent an all global email to staff describing work that had been done and the work that remained. So if I understand the outrage that's popped up in the last week, AUTA decided to start fear mongering in late October claiming that the water is unsafe. Okay, are, are we gonna be able to continue this evening's meeting? So, so you decided to start fear mongering when every individual teacher received an email on August 24th explaining what was happening and explained that there is a weeks long process for ordering, for getting those parts in, and then a four week flushing cycle before retesting. So AUTA has also promoted Cindy Menzel's October 26th article found on the CTA website about this stand. One line in that article states that the drinking water is unsafe, forcing teachers to bring water to make sure their students have clean drinking water. So I, I've got a request for you then. I'd like to know what teacher in our district was forced to bring water to school for their students. And please bring, that, bring your request that you sent to your administrator bring their rejection, and then please bring us with the receipts so we can reimburse you. So we have safe, healthy teaching spaces in our schools. Our principals are tasked with ensuring it. And if a school principal requires assistance beyond their authority or capability, they know how to contact the district staff. So I would ask AUTA to join us in making learning a priority rather than grandstanding. Enrollment has nearly doubled at one elementary school site but it's still well within its carrying capacity. For two decades, for two decades, our schools have seen continuous slide in enrollment without corresponding staff cuts or school consolidations. And I'm not here to blame any previous boards or administrators. I believe they tried to make the best decisions they could with imperfect information, just as we are today. You accuse this board of balancing the budget at the expense of students and teachers. Again, that allegation is entirely devoid of merit. The interim superintendent identified over $1 million in annual budget savings that we've already taken action on, primarily by cutting unfilled positions and reducing district staff at the district administration level. The first unfilled position eliminated was her own permanent position, meaning that if this board picks up a new superintendent, she has no job to return to in this district. PCOE's financial expert provided a report on our district in June. And among the findings, it was pointed out that our district has historically given raises to our teachers that we could not afford. So we, we could continue that practice. And many of those you teaching here today may not end up having a job in a few years because we won't have a district to run. So, all right. So, you know, I understand People have been encouraged to ask why the board isn't prioritizing our teachers. Um, and, and that was the question. Uh, so the answer to that is it's simple and we are prioritizing our students and the students that are gonna be coming to these schools in the future. That's our obligation to this community. So that's where our main priority here is. And uh, ma'am, uh, no, right, right, no, no, no. Nope. 
So, so this isn't going to be a back and forth discussion, but as, as you just described, 60 cases came to your site, you turned away 30. Okay. All right. Copy. Okay, so so still the offer was for 60 cases and the, the school took 30. So moving on then, and, and folks, this isn't gonna be a back and forth and we will end up closing this meeting if we can't keep it down. So you are hurting the yourselves and the community here. Moving on, Vice President Wedge, if you have anything. Good evening. Um, uh, first, I want to uh, address the board. Just uh, my appreciation for the uh, for the board members that um, that do get a chance to spend so much time during school hours. Unfortunately, um, with my career and with being a single family income, I don't always have that opportunity. So I appreciate the board members that do get the time to go on a more regular basis to the schools at some of the events, you know, representing us at the board. So I just want to um, just uh, say my appreciation on that. So thank you. And um, next, I want to kind of touch on a few things as well. Um, so being on this board for roughly a year now, um, I can honestly say that um, I can't recall that um, any time the uh, ATA has come up and done their presentation has uh, never really been on as far as um, partnering with the district and partnering with the board as far as to better our educational goals in our district. Because when you look at, um, President Holt touched on it a little bit, that our academic scores are one of the lowest in the county. And, um, and I think that should be the most uh, thing that should be discussed and um, something that we can partner with the, uh, with the AT, AUTA on. And another thing I wanna address that there has been no organization in the state of California that has done more damage to our children and has driven more families out of the public school systems other than the CTA. And currently, Please keep it down, folks. Thank you. And I would encourage the ATA to break those ties. There's other organizations out there like the parents. There's other organizations out there like the parents, the California Parents Union that actually line up with parental rights and children. So, and then one other thing I want to bring up, um, it was touched um, by President Holt, you know, some of the tactics that have been used. Back in February 16th of 2023, this board received a letter from all the teachers demanding if they was to go forward with the uh, with the school consolidations, this is their demands that they have to be met. That I took that, that was bullying tactics and, you should, and teachers should be setting the example, not the other way around. And and I stand firm with the president of the AT, AT, the Auburn Union Teacher Association that you let that letter go through. That shows a lack of your leadership. And like I've said, I am very disappointed with your leadership and I expect so much better from you. Thank you. Just to clarify, uh, they're all cheering for Sarah Liebert, but um, I'm Sarah Brickler, and uh, wow. I, um, uh, a couple of things. I, um, I just want to express my gratitude to the teams at our schools. I've had the opportunity to participate in a number of events, um, doing things like I couldn't be at the Renaissance Fair, but I helped set up. Um, participating in Trustee Ross's um, Auburn Elementary Cleanup Day, even attending the parent-teacher conferences that I recently attended, um, just how um, deeply invested um, our educators are and our students. It, it was deeply touching how, how much um, you, I'm sorry, you all love and care um, 
and go above and beyond to support and educate our kids. And um, I was recently volunteering as an art docent in a classroom where there was no uh, faucet available. It was tagged and we were unable to wash our hands. So that's just one, I, there might be some miscommunication, but there are still faucets tagged in classrooms where we cannot, we can, we're doing messy art projects and we still can't wash our hands. So I just wanna validate that, that I'm seeing it in person. And um, um, on a more positive note, the um, Auburn Education Foundation has a grant available to any staff. Um, the grant deadline is on November 15th. So please consider um, you know, bringing your great ideas and um, th those grants are intended for um, enrichment and things you may not otherwise have the funds to bring to your students. Um, it also supports things like Symphony Goes to School and the Renaissance Fair and other things that make school really enriching and special for students. Um, um, I had some people ask me about the survey that was presented about the, um, the options for the future of our district. And I just wanted to be clear that even though that's a document that says it's coming from the board, just take it for a, with a grain of salt when you see that this is a board survey, because sometimes we have zero involvement. I had zero opportunity to weigh in on the contents of the survey. And so I, I just want you to know that um, when it says that it's a board item, it may not reflect the, the will of the board. Um, I finally, I wanted to say thank you to our families for staying in our district and um, sticking with us and supporting your local school district through so much change and uncertainty. Um, I know I'm one of the families where my kids have been incredibly affected by um, our moves, um, our school closures and consolidations, all in an effort to make our, our budget solvent. But um, it's really hard on our staff and our students to have to make changes. And I just really greatly appreciate your support and patience um, as we have are having to make painful decisions to stop deficit spending. Um, this is Trusty Ross. Uh, I would like to share. Can you hear my microphone? Yes. Okay. Um, I first apologize that I cannot be there in person, especially for such an important meeting as tonight. Um, but I, I had very, very nice, wonderful things to say. And unfortunately, I was shook by individuals calling other people leaders when they have yet to show leadership themselves. And I, one more time, am asking to please show up and see the impact that has been made by your decision on our students, on our students, because you don't know which classrooms are affected by lack of water, which is a board policy this is a board policy that our board approved that we will make sure interior faucets and exterior faucets are in use and available. And we have not done that. And the fact that you don't know which classrooms are affected only shows you have not shown up. So please, please, Stop calling, telling people they are not leaders when you are not a leader yourself. Show up and be a part of the leadership of this district and show people that you care so we can all start caring together and actually find a solution to our problem. I am so astonished that we have not even talked about a plan for special education if we go TK through eight. We have not talked about setting boundaries and what that looks like for families in a situation in a district where we get to decide what school we go to, parent choice, and now we set boundaries. How does that affect our, our students, our families? We haven't talked about behaviors and the differences, the disciplines, 
We have no solid plan and we have to make, you're, you're making us make a decision today when we don't have a solid plan. We have CSEA telling us that there's chaos, there's stress, there's low morale. They don't have enough people to work. Teachers telling you that they're exhausted. I'm going to stop right there, but I just thank you teachers and staff for doing what you do. Thank you families for following through. Like, thank you so much for being the leaders when we can't seem to find them. Thank you for letting me share. All right, thank you. And moving on to item 10, our consent agenda. All right, is there anything that anybody would like to pull on the consent agenda? Seeing none, then I move that we approve tonight's consent agenda. Do you have a second? No, I would like one. I'll second. All right, and then again, it's a roll call vote right. since Trustee Ross is online. Okay, um, Vice President Wedge. Yes. Clerk Brickler, aye. Trustee Grigsby, aye. Trustee Ross, aye. President Holt, aye. Then moving to item 11 and 11A, is there any public comment on the approval of the annual organizational meeting date? All right, seeing none. The governing board of each school district shall hold an annual organizational meeting the annual organizational meeting must be selected by the governing board at the regular board meeting held immediately prior to the annual organizational meeting. The board meeting day selected for this meeting is December 13th, 2023. The meeting will begin at 7 p.m. Administration recommends approval. Uh, I move that we approve item 11A. Vice President Wedge, I'll second that. Then if Clerk Brickler could please conduct the roll. Sure. Um, Clerk Brickler, aye. Trustee Grigsby. Aye. Trustee Ross. Aye. President Holt. Aye. Vice President Wedge. Aye. All right. Ayes have it. Moving to item 11B. Is there any public comment on the approval to negotiation sunshine proposal to CSEA? All right, seeing none. Annually, the district proposes sunshines, which are areas of negotiations within the collective bar bargaining agreement with the California School Employees Association, otherwise known as CSEA, so that our union partners have an idea of what to anticipate at the bargaining table. Attached is CSEA or AUSD's proposal for the 23-24 negotiation year to CSEA. Administration recommends approval. This is President Holt. I move that we approve item 11B. Uh, Trustee Brickler, I will second. We'll call vote. Um, Trustee Grigsby. Aye. Trustee Ross. <laughs> President Holt. Aye. Uh, Vice President Wedge. Aye. Clerk Brickler, aye. Okay. And moving to item 11C. Um, the approval to implement district-wide TK-8. Um, and if we could have public comment on that, please. Ryan Batacher. I don't have anything. I don't have one. Go up and just talk at the microphone. I would like to start out with talking about uh, the, the stuff I've heard previously. So what I've heard from Holt and Wedge, I personally very d disagree with because teachers have a right to be provided cl cl good classroom environments and water, water and uh, lack of like pay weight, pay weight, very, very low pay, Wage makes teachers 
not want to do their job. They are very caring, caring and important individuals. And I completely agree what they have to say because they're, they're right. It's just what they do. And I just find it kind of upsetting that you guys disagree with it and you're trying to prove prove them wrong when you're not paying attention to the actual problems that are here. There's more problems. As a student, student I go to Evie Kane, I, I, all the teachers are amazing, amazing. It's an amazing place. But the thing is, mental standards are very low. Teachers are amazing. Everyone's amazing at, sc at schools, teachers and all that stuff. But it's the general environment that's causing a lot of problems. The TK through eight will cause a lot of problems due to uh, culture, like culture, because certain schools in different classrooms have different like cultures that are like how people react and do stuff in a certain way. And basically, if you don't do that correctly, it can cause a lot of problems and and it, it really, it's hard for students, students, and a bunch of other stuff needs to be set up. And you're doing this to quote unquote cut budgets, budgets when in reality you're like millions of dollars in debt, and the small amount that that you're trying to cut won't improve anything. You're so much in debt, and there's just too much to do, do and too much to cut. But it would just like the teachers might go on like like quits or strikes or whatever, and that could be influential. And plus, plus for the K for eight thing, uh, there's gonna be increased cost because we need because you'll need to hire more janitors, maintenance people, people, and all that stuff, and like possibly more IT guys. And everyone here works very very hard, hard for what they do, and. I personally think what you guys Holt and Wedge thinks is just BS. I really do not like what they think because that's just not the right thing. Thank you. Your time is up. Alicia Watkins. Thank you, board, for your time. Um, I moved here and came to a uh, TK through 8th district uh, up in Dutch Flat. Our graduating class was 15 kids, and that's because TK through 8th works in small communities, not large ones. I don't know any 8th grade class in the Auburn area that has 15 kids, you know. Um, Multi-age mentoring can be good when it's voluntary, but middle schoolers have a right to have a safe space amongst their peers where they're not in constant contact with younger children. They can be in constant contact with younger children at home. So they should have a right to just have that space here. Um, I'm gonna speak on mental health. Um, the kids have been through hell. COVID was hell on them. Consolidating schools was hell on them. The constant wars between the factions uh, culturally and civil rights has been hell on them. And now you want to upend everything. Uh, my kid went to Auburn L, two principals there. Um, the teachers did amazing. Um, but he went through hell with bullying. At Evie Kane, things were really, really rough when he started. Uh, now we have Miss Mayberry on, we've got a wellness center, we've got anti-bullying campaigns, things are settling down, things are getting better. If you want to know why kids' test scores are going down, it's because of all of the upheaval. It's not because teachers aren't doing a good job, it's because there's so much else going on in life. Okay. Um, my mom taught for 17 years. She taught at-risk students uh, here in Placer County. She had one of the most successful programs, had one dropout in 17 years. She taught gangbangers, drug dealers, 14-year-old mothers, and murderers, and, um, and she loved it. 
and they loved her and she was their rock. And when she was forced out because of Gail Garbolino Mojica, um, her, her program fell apart and schools in this entire county have been falling apart ever since Mojica came on board. And this district uh, has been suffering issues since then too. And I'm not saying it's her fault, but I'm saying there's a culture of shit slides downhill. Um, as far as all of these boots on the ground people who are here every day caring about countless children 24 seven, it's not an eight hour thing. They will care about these kids for the rest of their lives. What you said, Mr. Holt was incredibly disrespectful. You have a history of not having knowledge of what's going on on these school sites. Well, one piece of knowledge in my last 10 seconds, we've lost three kids to suicide in six months. I was just informed that by a school board member from a different district here, three kids. Maybe that should be the priority instead of cost cutting. Thank you. Shirley Paris. I'm putting on a different hat. Reese Across America is off, community member on. Good evening, um, board members. Thank you for letting me speak. My name is Shirley Paris, and I was a teacher in your district for 38 years. And I would like to propose a different approach, an innovative idea. According to your data, you have a very close split between parents who would like a K-8 situation and parents who would like a middle school situation. So here's my proposal. Handle the two schools of thought. Let us be an innovative school district and provide choice for our parents. We have room on the Sky Ridge campus that could create a K-8 situation and become a magnet school magnet based on something of their choice to collect parents. We already have a middle school model in place and our elementary school model. We could follow after Weimar and have our middle school kids. Evie Kane was once a 5-8 school district or 5-8 school. So we could move our fifth graders and our sixth graders together creating fifth grade, a um, fifth grade village, which once housed sixth grade, and allow them to have their um, in closed classroom be separate, but on the same campus, alleviating the overcrowdedness at Auburn Elementary. That would leave Auburn Elementary as a TK four school, following a Weimar model, a K-8 at Sky Ridge, following our surrounding district, and that gives parents a choice, innovation to address the needs of our changing parent community. Three things could result. We could retain the parents that we currently have because they would have a choice. We could attract possibly new parents because we could offer those advanced things at the middle school, such as our leadership classes, our service club, our after school program, our sports programs, our advanced classes, our honors classes, our electives, while still accommodating at Sky Ridge with a model where they chose to be that magnet, whether it was science or technology, they could be a magnet school for that. And we could use those use facility funds to update our campuses, repair what we need to repair instead of retrofitting a middle school that is completely functional as a middle school and would take quite a bit of work to make it a, uh, to allow for primary grades. So I always told my students, if you're not part of the solution, you are part of the problem. So here's the other caveat I will answer, add, I will head an ad hoc committee for you, voluntarily on my time. Thank you. Nicole Schichtel. Hello board, my name is Nicole Schichtel and I'm currently the activities director 
leadership teacher, computer teacher, PBS teacher lead, service club advisor, and MTSS team member at EVK. Needless to say, I love my school. I'm here to speak to you tonight about my previous experience working at a TK-8 school for seven years in the greater Sacramento district or area. You will shortly see a presentation from our superintendent about moving our district to a TK-8 model. I'd like to address some of the points that she has made in this presentation. In working at a TK-8, when our students were finished in fifth grade, one third of our population left to go to a traditional middle school. Reasons from a parent that I'm still in contact with include better prepared for high school, changing classes with different peers, giving students the opportunity to meet more peers from different life experiences, more options, including electives, different teachers, honors classes, learning to be a small fish in a big pond, most existing K-8s were elementary schools prior and not set up for middle school. We have also, my, at my previous school, we did not have any clubs because we had no students that were interested and there were not enough teachers to advise them. Currently, E.B. Kane has Earth Club, Service Club, Art Club, Medical Careers Club, and Chess Club. Our Service Club does many different events, including Veterans Day celebrations, Hometown Heroes, Valentine's at the senior home and donating to many different local charities. We have 25 members and splitting all these kids up would not let us keep our club. As for our sports league in my K-8, we did not have a sports league that was competitive. It was a rec league and our students did not attend our games because it was not part of our school. This did not bring a sense of community among our students and also our leadership class could not have fundraisers like snack bars at different games. At E.V. Kane, currently we have 21 different electives for our students. At my previous K-8, we had four for all three years of middle school. E.V. Kane needs their electives. This is what brings our students there. Also for ELD, we only had one ELD class for our middle school students. E.V. Kane currently has four, where all students are broken up based on their ability levels. I taught ELD in the beginning class. Having those beginning students in with our level four students is not feasible. Also, PE is a concern. Having middle school PE students out doing PE during elementary lunch, it's impossible for PE teachers to teach. Also, in the seven years I was there, we had three principals and no vice principal. Our principals left due to burnout. Please consider that our district's mission is that every student is at the heart of our decision, and please think about our children when you make this choice. Thank you. Teresa Zaro. Thank you. Wow, a lot of emotions tonight. and. Um... I wish I could just do like ditto around what everybody has already said. I'm Teresa Zaro. I'm a community member and a parent of an Evie Kane sixth grader. Um, I really actually wanted to start by sincerely thanking you. A month ago, the community and some of the trustees asked for more information about this, and um, you really delivered. I, I have a ton more information, um, so I appreciate that. Um, Unfortunately, it kind of shifted my anger at being in the dark into like a very deep sadness at what we are all facing, the tough choices that we do all have to make. Um, and I, um, I don't know where to go from that, but I never try to show up at one of these things only to complain. Or um, So I am... Um, wanting to share a few things that um, I think could be acted on um, as we go through this decision-making process. Um, something that I want us to never forget uh, when we're looking at these this data and statistics is that um, these enrollment numbers and staff, they're real humans. Um, my real human uh, might be peeled off from two thirds of his friends and sent to, frankly, an a old portable classroom in the corner of a campus that he already graduated from. That's just one human. Um, and every person in this room and in our community has that own story. 
Um, so keep that in mind. Um, second, I'd really like to see a tallying up of the costs of this reconfiguration. I know we've talked about playgrounds and moving costs, um, but I think we need to put some more work into putting numbers to that. Or if you already have, share that with the community. Um, and then uh, another thing is, um, I think your presentation did speak to how great TK8 schools are. Um, and I've been involved in some of those reconfigurations. It is a becoming a popular switch from elementary only to TK8. Um, but what our, how di our district is different than those other districts is that those are not a budget saving measure. Those are usually funded by huge bond measures. Um, I was looking at an example of Natomas Unified School District um, a couple of years ago, converted three of their elementary schools to TK-8. Sounds pretty comparable, but it costs $50 million. So we're not gonna be able to pull off those results that you are advertising with um, the situation we are in. Thank you very much. Shannon Stafford. Hi, thanks for giving me a chance to speak. Um, I just wanted to start out, I didn't have this part planned before, but upon hearing some of the discussion, um, I just like to remind you all that the board is held to a high standard of professionalism. It would be helpful if you took time to practice how to handle difficult conversations before the next board meeting. A couple of the board members' tones are condescending and attacking. It is your job. Um, to do the opposite of that. In the face of that, it's your job to do the opposite of that. And unless you can do that, this isn't the right job for you. Um, so I just hope you take that into consideration. Um, one specific example is to say that it's the teacher's job to reach out to you to about test scores. That just doesn't match how schools work. It's the board's job with the superintendent to connect with the teachers and to work together on a plan. Um, according to the TK-8 plan, a plan like this should never be drafted without stakeholders at all levels. School decisions should never be made without teachers directly involved. They are the experts who know what students need the most. In addition to lacking stakeholders in the planning, this document has barely been shared with the community and has not given our town time to process the information. When the decision was to push the vote back a month, teachers, parents, and students should have been invited into the process. It would be shocking for the board to vote on this tonight, having looked over the plan. The plan reads more like a vision for something asked for by a community rather than a plan to exit a budget crisis. My son attends E.B. Kane as a sixth grader and he's having a fantastic year. Um, he has made it clear to me that E.B. Kane needs to stay in middle school. That's his perspective. So it doesn't help that this document reads like it's a needed thing um, because the principal and the teachers at E.B. Kane are killing it this year. And so I would just like to really highlight that and have that sink in. And I would love it if the board also came from that position. You mentioned that this decision will affect some teachers, but a decision like this will absolutely affect every single teacher. This mistake reveals a lack of understanding of how schools work by this board member who is clearly not fit to lead a school district. Thank you. Alex Vetter. Hi, I'm Alex. I have um, two students at Sky Ridge Elementary. Um, after reviewing the plan you proposed multiple times, it was challenging to understand the specifics of the proposed budget cuts and how the transition of all three school sites to a K three eight or K through eight configuration would yield long term benefits. Uh, it appears to be a short term solution, lacking a comprehensive examination 
of its impact on our students and our budget. Additionally, the survey distributed asked about our preference for maintaining the current school structure or trans transitioning to K through eight. Um, and it seems to imply that we actually have a choice in this matter. Um, it raises the question of whether budget constraints are even the primary drive driving force behind these proposed challenges. Uh, the survey results indicate most are in favor of maintaining the current structure. So I'm just wondering if the board is taking this feedback into account and exploring alternative strategies. Um, do we actually get a choice? Um, or was the survey just a mere formality um, that gave us the impression that we actually had input in on in this decision. Um, finally, I've observed significant division among the members of this board. The evident lack of common ground and the tone of interactions among board members are concerning. As, as representatives of our community, students, and families, it's essential that the board collaborates to foster unity and make collective, well-informed decisions. Your current divisiveness is disheartening. You must find some unity as you move forward. And I think this involves you working closely and respectfully with our teachers and staff, actually listening and collaborating with them. This is pivotal as we progress into making some really big decisions. Thanks. And as that was seven, if there's additional public comment after this evening's, the rest of the meeting, the agenda is continued, or excuse me, uh, ended, then we'll continue that public comment. So moving on to the presentation. Trustee Brickler, may I ask, were there additional comments beyond the seven that we heard? How many additional? If, if there's ahead. three, then yes, let's please let's hear those now. Then, so Thank Superintendent, you. Um, if we hear the the three remaining comments, please. Thank you, Mr. Berkeley. Tara Kavrikas. Hi. Thank you for your time. After. Watching or looking at the uh, the presentation, I felt it was definitely one sided and there was an agenda going into creating that slideshow. It was definitely that Evie Kane was not the popular decision. Clearly stated with the uh, current enrollment slide that showed that Evie Kane's current enrollment was down 31%. But at the elementary school level during that same time is close to 25%. So if you have that coming into it, of course, it's going to be lower. So the whole picture of the district should be presented, not just a one-sided view of how E.V. Kane has declined. Yes, E.V. Kane went through some tough times over the past decade. The, over the past few years, though, they have turned around and it is a phenomenal school in our area. Keeping a comprehensive middle school, which is clearly what the survey showed our public and parents want, would be the best thing for these students. You have over 190 students that are in honors and advanced classes at EV Kane, and to try to duplicate that over three sites is going to be nearly impossible at the same high standard that is already there. Sports will not be the same. On that slide, it suggested rec sports and the Placer High School Junior Program, which is the football program, which if you've ever looked at any of our rec programs, is expensive for families. School sports is a way for parents who cannot afford to pay the rec prices for their students to be able to participate in these after-school activities. Still, there are no numbers and no options for anything other than becoming a TK-8. What are the other options? We need to see those to fully understand the budget options and what it would fully take for that. My son went through your program. He went through four elementary school principals in a K through five. We continue to see principals turning over because there's 
no consistency. There's no um, plan. There's nothing for them to look forward to. They get burnt out. So you need to work with the teachers be respectful. What I saw tonight was not an example of what I want my student to see adults and a board of our community acting like. Thank you. Kristen Dutro. Hello, I'm Kirsten Dutro. I've been a science teacher at E.B. Kane for 22 years. Uh, I spoke last month, I'm speaking again. A um, Couple of things that I noticed from the survey, or not the survey, but the slideshow that was presented or is going to be presented here in a little bit. Um, first off, a few weeks ago, a survey went out asking the community what sort of school configuration they wanted to see in the schools. Uh, I'm a numbers person, so I divided this out. The results show that of the 543 people that responded, 312 or 57% want to keep the current model we have while only 226 or 42% want a TK-8. That is a 15% difference between the two. Meaning the majority of the community in Auburn, the parents and students of Auburn want to keep the current middle school model. It seems that much of this debate is being driven by finances. We've heard a lot about uh, the costs and the problems with the school district. Auburn Union is currently in fiscal recovery and the Office of Education is concerned about the district's management of funds. By becoming a TK-8 district, it is being stated that we will save approximately $471,000. Just for reference, the district's current unrestricted revenue is $19 million. 470,000 is 2.5% of the unrestricted budget. That is not even mentioning the restricted funds. Currently, we have a 3% reserve that is state mandated, but it's also shown on the budget statement that we have an additional 4% reserve set aside by the board that is almost a million dollars. Is this a rainy day fund? Because if you hadn't noticed by the sea of people in here tonight, it is raining pretty hard right now. Why aren't we using these funds to keep a little normalcy and consistency instead of implementing another major disruption for a second year in a row? Furthermore, even though the fiscal committee and the board has asked how much it will cost to make all of the changes to a TK-8 model, we have never seen, or we never seem to get an estimate of the amount. And I'm betting that it would be much more than the 470,000 that we may save. According to one other presenter, it was 13 million to go TK-8. Um, by changing to a TK-8 district, we would be getting rid of one of the many things that make us different. How many students and teachers will we lose because we don't offer a traditional middle school format? Middle school students would lose electives, clubs, advanced classes, and a competitive sports league. My son attended Sky Ridge. He then went to E.B. Kane, then he went to Plaster High School, and he's now a freshman in college. Some of you in the audience might have actually been his teachers. If, however, at the time, our only option was a K-8, I would have taken them down the hill. I would have gone to a six through eight district. Thank you, your school. time is up. You're for real cutting me off. Bristol Scanlon. Good evening. Um, I thought long and hard about how I was going to utilize my time this evening. Um, and I wanted to recognize um, Sarah Brickler um, and Miss uh, J. Ross Pirelli. Um, it is my understanding that Sarah Brickler has a master's in education. Um, I've seen Sarah at the school multiple times. Um, I've spoken to her during different community events. 
um, town hall meetings at the schools. Um, she genuinely listens to what I have to say as a parent of two small children within the district. She then takes our conversations um, and uses her education to come up with ideas as to how she can help represent me as a parent and my children on the district. Um, Jay Ross Pirelli, who is what I consider um, a friend of mine, is one of the most creative people I have ever met. Um, I believe that the board, um, for whatever reason, from my opinion, doesn't listen to Sarah and Jamie's insights as much as I feel they should be heard. I believe that with Jamie's creativity and Sarah's education in education, if they were given the ability to make more decisions or if the rest of the board members followed behind them as much as they follow behind our president, that not only the parents and children, but the teachers may be more happy and we can come up with a more creative, better solution. And that's all I wanted to say today. Thank you. As a point of clarification, Trustee Ross just earned her master's degree in education recently as well. So I don't want to don't want her to be left out. Thank you. Down, sir. Down, Miss. Okay. Thank you. Good evening, President Holt, trustees, staff, and guests here today. Um, at the last board meeting, I was asked to present a more comprehensive view, look into what a TK-8 would look like. And so um, going back to a couple of board meetings ago, the board asked me to propose some reductions because we do need to cut $2.5 million from our budget. Um, and so I took a look back at what had historically happened with the budget committee um, and what the board had adopted. And I put forward um, some of the, um, the proposed cuts that I thought would get us started to, to just take a look at and see where we, um, where we could go with those. Um, and then again, like I said, the last board meeting, the board wanted more detail. And so this slide deck created tonight in this presentation is to provide that detail, um, the snapshot into what a TK-8 could look like for Auburn. So um, the benefits of a TK-8 per um, the research that I've done and conversations I've had with superintendents, uh, there is um, the opportunity to have cross-age tutors and a buddy program. There is early access to sports. There's a family atmosphere. Siblings attend the same school. Um, the campuses feel safer, less discipline and behavior. More diverse student and teacher populations. No, disrup no disruptive transition from fifth to sixth grade. Students grow from new learners to mentor younger students, and parent involvement remains steady in a TK-8 grade environment. And that's according to, again, research and um, superintendents that I met with. So um, some of, our, of my superintendent colleagues in surrounding um, areas here in Placer County um, let me know that it really became um, clear that the benefits are felt by their families, um, the benefits of the TK-8 uh, school. I spoke with a superintendent who gives out a family survey each year, and she said that um, of the 140 students of ours that she has, uh, 140 students of our students who go to her TK-8 school, one of the top um, measured um, evidence of success is that they like the TK-8 family feeling.
I did put some research into this slide deck, which I'm sure you've had a chance to look at and you can read for yourself. And I did put research regarding the benefits of a TK-8 as this was what was requested of me by the board because we have the comprehensive middle school model currently. We have the TK-5 model currently. The board asked me for information on what a TK-8 would look like. Therefore, this is the research. I have to take my glasses off and on. I apologize. <clears throat> okay, those so student supports, you're not gonna see a whole lot of different on these slides because we are already providing student family um, supports, but I am going to highlight what we're doing and talk about what the differences could look like. Our students have an ac uh, access to a broad course of study. As you've heard tonight, their teachers are providing core um, curriculum and we are providing electives to students. Um, so ELA, math, social sciences, science, um, ELD, physical education, visual and performing arts, world languages is something that we are providing, but not at every site, but it is something that we could provide to all three sites in this particular model. The applied arts, specialized education, band, leadership opportunities, journalism, and in a TK-8 model, we could offer a mentor program at our sites, um, train students who are interested in that type of a program um, to buddy and mentor um, other students on campus. Um, as part of that broad course of study, you heard a little bit tonight about the clubs that we offer at our sites. We would continue clubs. Currently we have a board games club, mindfulness art, homework help, drama club, art club, science, technology, engineering and math, otherwise known as STEM robotics, chess, Dungeons and Dragons, gardening, Met we could offer um, medical careers and, or we do offer medical careers and service clubs as well. So this is exciting. I don't see any changes happening to the clubs that are provided to our students. Um, maybe the change would be if they were offered in the TK environment and they're only currently um, offered at 6-8 right now, they could be offered to younger students as well. So you heard a little bit about sports tonight from the public and I've heard quite a bit about sports as well. Sports is something that, um, that our community um, has a great interest in. Um, and we know that some students connect to their education through sports. So it was asked of me at the last board meeting to look into what the options could be to provide sports to our students. Um, the last time this was done, it was during the um, PREP committee meetings. And um, one of the members, I wasn't part of that committee, but I would sit in from time to time. And I did hear one of the members of the committee report to the committee that Faisal would only um, honor and grandfather the E.V. Kane students in their program. And since then, we have found out that Faisal potentially would open up to three schools. They would have to take that to a vote um, with their uh, board. And so that would be something that I would need to explore more about. But that was also something I thought was not possible. Um, and so in doing this research, learned that there was a possibility to stick with Faisal. Um, I've also spoken with local superintendents that have TK-8 models, actually all of our local um, districts close by and, and um, they have TK-8 models and uh, there is a huge interest in competing um, in sports and um, having Auburn participate in their sports programs. And then um, you can see on the slide that I listed all of the programs that we currently do, such as cross country, dance club, trekkers, volleyball, basketball, wrestling um, at the middle school and the elementary level. So <clears throat> we would definitely want to explore all of the ways that we could to ensure that our kids have, uh, have access to sports. Would you please advance to that slide? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I'll give you a second to read it since I didn't advance it. Uh, 
Okay. I did speak with um, Alan Shuttleworth, a former a retired superintendent from um, a, a nearby district, and he did give me some of his insight and experience as well. Um, he told me other districts that feed into Plaster High School are TK models. Their students are prepared academically and in regards to sports. The TK8 model allows students to participate in sports at a younger age, such, such as fourth or fifth grade. He offered his experiences with that, where he had students in fourth and fifth grade who were ready to uh, compete. Um, with the older students. And so he was able to, in his district, work that into the sports program. Um, so there has been some some questions about our Title I programs and how we support our unduplicated students. Our Title I programs would continue to be um, uh, offered to each school. So we know that our unduplicated students um, generate the funds that we um, use for our title programs. Thank you. I'm going to have issues clicking. Okay, thanks. Um, and so this year, all of our sites have access to that title funding. Um, that was something that we wanted to, um, to have programs at each site with that layered um, funding um, that will continue to happen. Um, the non-academic supports, such as um, our school meal program and, um, you know, meeting our social emotional um, needs of our students, those will all continue to happen at our three sites. And I, I know that that was brought up a little bit tonight as well about um, the students' mental health and wellness through a transition. Um, all of our staff are trained to implement PBIS, that's positive behavior intervention um, supports. And so, um, and I put strategies on the slide, but it supports. And so um, that would continue as well. We would not stop that program. Our English learners, uh, we would continue to ensure that English learners receive language acquisition support for their continuous progress. And as the board already knows, um, our goal is to um, graduate our students out, reclassify them within four years. We will continue to strive to do that. So this is a mock-up schedule and it's, it's a little tricky because it's hard to schedule, um, you know, a master schedule is quite a complicated process as our principals will tell you. Um, so what we did was we took, um, we took a schedule and we just kind of worked out what, a, what it would, could potentially look like at a site. Now, I wanna remind the board that until we know how many students we have and what electives they choose and, some of that's going to be worked out through the LCAP process and talking with students at the sites through the LCAP process as well, through student voices. Um, you know, we would determine what the electives are, and then we and then principals would take the electives and the programs that we're offering, and they would work out their own master schedules. But in the meantime, because there was a desire to have a visual for what a schedule could look like, we put this mock-up together for you. So what you'll see here is um, in the 6-8 model in a TK-8 program, you would have the core um, subjects being offered um, for the sake of what we are projecting enrollment to be. We put two classes for each, and then we included prep. Now we know that um, we will need to have um, teachers to provide electives. And so we were looking at which types of funding we could use to provide a wide variety of electives. And so looking at the um, Prop 28, the Art Music Block Grant, the um, Supplemental Concentration Dollars, we decided that we could put together quite a comprehensive list of electives that we know students um, already are asking for, just as an example. And then we could hire um, itinerant staff to provide those electives. And then I just want to remind the board that with block grant funds, we have to be sure that, and, and with Prop 28, that we're not uh, supplanting funds. And so um, that's something that we will have to look at if we already have a teacher and we want to fund another 
the program would have to look a little different or we would have to find a way to show that we're not supplanting. Our before and after school programs, I did confirm with our partners that they would they would be able to accommodate all of our um, potential students, um, the grade levels, all the grade levels of potential students. So um, our support staff, this would be the list that we anticipate our support staff um, would look like. So we would still have our itinerant positions um, and then we would have more itinerant positions, um, particularly for electives and such. Um, we were thinking about having um, potentially a teacher on special assignment that could um, organize a STEM type of program. Um, that was an idea because we heard from the community and students that STEM was important to them. So we're tossing out some of those ideas, tossing those ideas around, uh, but also knowing that our program is determined um, how we use our supplemental concentration funding is determined by um, our work with the community and um, the staff and the students uh, through the LCAP process. And then at the site, you have, you know, of course, our teachers and our paras, um, custodial maintenance, child nutrition, campus monitors, uh, just to give you the basic. So family and community engagement at the site level, we would continue to have Family University, um, our ELAC committees. Um, we do have a community liaison program and we're still hiring. So if anybody wants to apply for the position we have open, please do. Um, watch the Watchdogs program has been successful. We have Meet the Masters Art Volunteer Program, which has been digitized and scheduled out for the year within the educational services calendar. Principals has, have access to that and they're ensuring that they work with their volunteers on that. That program will continue. Uh, we have site word busters and master gardeners. We have more than that, but that those were the main uh, to name those few. At the district level, we will continue our, of course, our LCAP planning, um, community engagement meetings, the parent advisory committee, um, of course, our student voices advisory committee. We had our first, um, our first, our first in a while resource fair that was very successful, and I've been asked if we're bringing that back each year. Um, again, our community liaison program, our DLAC, and we have our um, gifted and talented education committee that we started last year to um, help us set the vision and the tone for GATE in our um, district. So at the last meeting, it was asked of me to um, verify that 2.5 million is what we were asked to cut. And in fact, it was 2.5 to 3 million. Um, we stuck with the 2.5 because that's the number that was put in writing by the fiscal expert assigned to us from PCOE, Dennis Snelling. So what I did was I just took the, um, the excerpt from his report and put it in, in here um, for reference. And then the savings for a TK-8 program district-wide, when we, we're just looking right now at certificated FTE, so we're looking at a reduction of three, and then moving to certificated FTE to um, restricted funding. Um, we're looking at uh, a 0.5 FTE classified position, and that's how we came um, to the conclusion that we would cut uh, $471 thousand five hundred sixty one dollars by um, moving to this model in FTE. So the multi year projections with approved reductions and updated revenue. Um, so again, with the current approved reductions so far, um, our our fund balance at the end of year three um, would be $3,369,571. And we have Heather Leslie here tonight who can um, um, drill down a little bit into that. Well, I'm sure that once I'm done with the presentation, you'll have questions. Then we have our um, the MYP with the proposed reconfiguration. And you'll see that our fund balance would be $4,350,099 at the end of year three. And that would eliminate the structural deficit. 
Um, as you can see here, our unduplicated uh, count is projected to have increased by 171 students. Um, and I say projected because as we work through first interim, we will have final numbers for you um, during that report. But as of this moment, 171, and um, part of the reason that we believe our, our unduplicated count went up is that we, um, we, we put the forms into uh, data confirmation and we asked all families to please um, provide us with their updated data confirmation um, before they would have access to ARIES. This year we had a very high rate of data confirmation before the school year started. And so what data confirmation is, in case you're wondering, um, is where parents go in and they update their, their information for their student. And it's very important to us as a school district, not just to find out who, um, you know, who qualifies as unduplicated. That's just one piece. And actually that's not even a mandated piece because we can't mandate that in this um, confirmation, but it is to get an idea of, you know, um, updated contacts and what students' allergies may be and that type of thing. So it helps us get to know our students better. But by putting in that form for parents to fill out, parents chose to fill out that form, more parents did than have in the last few years. Oh, and I didn't click, so I apologize. I'll give you a second. Okay. And then, um, we always want to put this back in the slide deck because it's so hard to understand um, the, the different levels of funding. And so um, just bringing back to, you know, the board and the community, um, what the, the base grant, that that's the basic funder, funding that covers salaries and retirement and instruction and that type of thing. Um, and then we have the supplemental um, funding, which um, helps us to increase and improve services for our unduplicated students. And then our concentration fund, um, which when we are over 55% in unduplicated students, we get this increased amount of funding. Oops. There we go. And then um, everyone's favorite, the buckets. Uh, so this is just a graphic again. It's just a reminder and a reteach, if you will, of what the buckets are. And you can see here what our buckets are for teaching and learning. We have our supplemental concentration, which I've talked a lot about tonight. Um, that's tied to our LCAP goals um, and uh, with input from the community and our students and our staff. We have our um, special, special education funding. Um, we have our title funding. We have our art music grants and our EEBG, which is educator effectiveness block grants. So those block grants, um, which are restricted funds. We have our ELOP, which is expanded learning, ah, ELOP, we say ELOP all the time. It's our expanded learning program um, for students that we primarily use for before and after school care for our students. And um, we are providing before and after school care through our campus monitor program, but also through um, Boys and Girls Club, ARD and Champions as well. And then our ESSER and COVID funding, which is actually set to expire soon. Um, so these buckets of money are important to remember. Um, you can do certain things with certain uh, funding. Um, so when people ask, how can we cut the budget here, but then put a playground there, it's different restricted funding uh, that we have set aside for instances like, you know, repairs or building needs or, or what have you versus the teaching and learning buckets, which are primarily looking at here. So this was actually in my first um, proposal, uh, you know, because the board had asked for um, for a, a comprehensive package of what could possibly be cut. And so um, the goal here would be that if we cut or we reconfigure or we do some of the things that we're doing, then we don't have to get to this, right? Um, the board also knows that when I proposed the first um, 1.7 of cuts that there are areas where we need to bargain, right? And so these would be some of those areas. So if the board um, chooses to implement the TK model, we will absolutely be able to revisit some of those proposed reductions.
And then our current enrollment does show a decline, um, uh, a 31 percent um, decline, and we actually lost more students than we projected at our middle school this year. Um, and so, you know, I, we have to be honest about the enrollment. I have to show you the enrollment of our middle school since that's what we're talking about today. Um, and we also have an, um, an enrollment report for you uh, that you actually, that's um, on the agenda, that slides are there as well for the public to access for the district's enrollment. <clears throat> and then it was asked about, um, I was asked about the uh, plan for boundary adjustments. And so what we would do in, in December, um, if the board decides to go the way of TK8, then we would um, get demography information updated and attendance boundary recommendations. Those recommendations then would come to the board and the board would approve them. Um, and that would be in January. And then in January, uh, maps would be drawn and redistributed to school sites and the district um, websites and that type of thing. And then we would notify families in January, February. So the, um, the proposed timeline is here. And again, that's if the board chooses to move to a TK8 model. And then um, there was also, there were also some questions about, you know, if, um, if some of our schools appear to be full now, how will we move in through more grade levels? But with those attendance boundary adjustments, it wouldn't be that we're just moving kids with other kids. It would be that once the boundaries are adjusted, we would take a look at, you know, um, our projected enrollment, which we currently project to be um, what you see here. So currently at Auburnell, we have 546. We would project about 432 with those atten uh, with those boundary adjustments. EV Kane, currently 474, we would project um, a higher enrollment. And then at Sky Ridge, you can see the numbers there, 428, 421, staying pretty similar. Um, there were also questions that came to me about um, what if my student is wants to stay at their school currently, but it's not going to end up being in my boundary. Um, and, you know, as the board has made clear over the years, our district offers school of choice opportunities for families. And so we currently have students that are, um, whose boundaries are in one school but they're in another. Um, they're on intra-district transfers. We absolutely will continue that practice. We don't anticipate um, having to stop that. You know, um, when a school becomes impacted, then we use those attendance boundaries as that backdrop of, you know, or that backstop really of, you know, well, you know, we'll have to put you on a waiting list when a position opens or when a, um, excuse me, not position, but a, um, a desk opens, then we'll go ahead and honor that intra-district transfer. And these calculations you see here, these are just us um, projecting, right? So you will see more firm numbers once we have the boundaries redrawn if the board chooses to move to the TK model. So the goal was really to have some time to work with principals, but principals are very busy this time of year. And, um, you know, having a few weeks to put something together and refine it and double check it and get it out to the public and to the board. Um, you know, you, we had to work um, faster than we would uh, when we're actually doing the planning. And so um, I did meet with principals. We did talk a little bit about what their campuses would look like. Um, Principal Mayberry put together uh, this map here that you don't see yet because I haven't clicked. There we go. And I know it's probably hard to see from the audience, but um, if you open the document, you can see a little bit better and zoom in. Um, but she put together something that she proposed that could potentially work at her site. Now, again, until we have numbers of enrollment and we, you know, have everything, you know, kind of um, uh, finalized and she's built a master schedule, um, things could look different. I mean, we know this, that happens year by year anyway. Um, but this is what she came up with that she could do at her site. Um, and then you'll see there um, is a playground 
that she positioned in over by the Dragilla gym and then another playground uh, that would serve just TK and K students. Now, one thing that Miss Mayberry, Principal Mayberry said to me was, you know, sixth to eighth grade students like the playground too. Would they be able to have access to that? And in speaking with one of my colleagues today um, who uh, is a superintendent of a TK-8 district. The middle schoolers in her district absolutely love the playground as well. So I thought that was great insight from the principal. And um, if the board chooses this model, I would look forward to more insight and more planning with the principals as we would have a little bit more time than this last three weeks. Um, these are campus maps that I, I just took a, um, I just, I marked them up myself. Um, I did not have a chance to work with our, our elementary principals on these. I know that um, Principal Ade um, had drawn out some maps, but we didn't really connect um, to have a conversation about them. So uh, I just, I put these in just to kind of show that there is space and, and kind of where that spacing could be. But again, it's up to the principal and the staff where the classrooms will be, what's the best fit for their school. That's not really, um, for me to decide. And it's the same with the Auburn Elementary campus. And then departmental considerations. I know that there is a lot of concern when there is a change coming and um, we kind of took some considerations from last year and we um, took some things that we thought we could, you know, do a little bit differently this year. And we just came up with this brief list. These are not the only considerations, but these are just the big considerations. Um, you know, how would we um, move classrooms and, um, you know, what would child nutrition do to adjust to the food services and that type of thing. So you can see here what we put, um, and when Dave and I talked, I said, you know, Dave, I don't really think there's a lot that you're going to have to um, to worry about because you're already providing one-to-one -one devices for all of our students. So, um, so we agreed that while there would be some things that he and his department um, would do um, differently in a TK model, that we would absolutely have the resources and the staffing to ensure that we can offer one-to-one -one devices. And then um, the timeline. So this, again, is a proposed timeline, and you can see the different colors on there. They represent what different departments uh, would be doing. And so this is just a basic timeline for the big things that we would have to do. There will be many smaller things, but again, I don't work um, outside of our principal team. Our principal team has expertise and leadership, and they know their site. And so, um, and they work with their staff. And so what I put together for you is just really that, you know, few weeks to get you the best information I could get you so that you can make the most informed decision about what a TK program could look like in Auburn. And then the survey results are there. I wanted to make sure um, to get those in. Uh, for you up to the last minute, um, we didn't put the survey results in until just before we published. So we um, knew that we gave a good solid, I would say just about a month for um, everybody to be able to, um, to weigh in. And I'm sure you'll have questions and there may be a lot. So I'm gonna have a seat and um, field your questions. President Holt. Um, and actually, before we get into those questions, uh, I try to stage our recesses at about every two hours. Um, so I would like to take a 10 minute recess. I'm going to round up to 8.57. Uh, so we will resume at 9.07.
is 9.07, so we will resume here and open it up for questions and discussion uh, on our end. Oh, what's that? No, please. Go ahead. Yeah. So, thank you, folks. Uh, this is Trustee Brickler. I had asked that we go back to the slide that talks about the cost savings. Please, Director Peters. Um, you know, I, I just wanted to recognize that we we do have to find some kind of path to solvency. Um, as a district, we need to find a way to stop deficit spending and to um, you know um, be very very cognizant of our costs. Um, Let's see, where were we with? Um, so yeah, keep going back. A few more slides. There, thank you. Okay, um, initially when the idea of TK8 came up, it came up through the budget committee and there was a completely different methodology for how we would save costs. There was a comparison of middle school costs, comparison of elementary school costs, and then the differences between them. And then more recently, we've been presented with this. And so I'm just trying to understand why this methodology methodology changed. And I am I still am struggling to explain to people how we can have the same number of schools, the same number of students, and yet eliminate three certificated FTE. I know I've tried. I've, I, I have had this explanation provided to me, but I am still struggling to um, explain it to others. Um, thank you. This is CDO Leslie. Um, so when we originally came up with the methodology, that was one that was it's, it was kind of worked on in a cabinet level. And um, this time, what we really strove for was instead of looking at some of the things that are very variable, such as utility uses and things like that, was um, actually just more focused on, you know, staff, like what what we knew from the program that we would be able to eliminate. So that's why when we had talked about it previously is, is this the end or is like this is this is like, you know, the the minimum amount and it or the maximum amount. Um, usually, you know, like I said previously, like this was the minimum amount. So when you saw the 409 previously, that was just based on what we had come up with. And I said, there's still the possibility to save more. Um, this is just a safe, um, you know, guesstimate as to what we could be at as we tooled through um, some of the exercises of attempting to come up with a mock-up or a draft or a sample um, schedule and staffing, as you guys saw in uh, Superintendent Lucci Garcia's presentation, um, we actually found that we could net additional staffing. So that's why the number has increased from the 409 as well. Um, I still can't explain why 3FTE could be cut. If somebody could help me understand. Um, do you want to take that one or do you want me to start? And, and specifically teaching staff. So when we look at the middle school model, we know that um, that our, our current middle school has um, some classes that have that are low in enrollment, and part of that is that our initial projections for our middle school and how we staffed. I hear some feedback in my microphone. Um, we're with 53 more students than we actually had, and so when we looked at our current student to staff ratio and we projected out what enrollment would be. And then we um, split the six, eight model amongst three schools. This is this is how we got to that number. And then the um, the two certificated FTE. Wait, do you mind if I pause on the three? I'm still stuck on the three. Um, you, you've indicated that we had 53 fewer students at Kane than projected and that that has caused there to be some classes that aren't aren't full. That seems like a separate issue to me. That seems like, and it's a real challenge for districts because you have to notify staff, um, you know, in the spring about whether or not there will be a job for them. And then we don't know until mid-August 
who arrives at school. So I understand that we have some, um, you know, there are some constraints when we're planning, but the fact that those students didn't come to, they didn't um, attend school as expected, isn't that something that, I mean, I don't think that we can expect that that's going to happen year to year. It seems like that's something that we, um, or, or, or maybe we try to be strategic about, maybe we go in understaffed, if that seems to be a trend. It seems like something that we could manage. This is like a kind of a separate situation that we could, like if there were a vacancy, we, we could try to make adjustments to accommodate that. So it might seem like a separate issue, but we still have 53 fewer students in middle school. And so when you look at taking this model and, and um, having TK-8 at each site, we have to look at how many classes we will be able to have with the students that we'll have on those campuses. And again, we are projecting. Um, and so with those projections, we determined that there would be, in, as you saw in the model, approximately two, and then you break down, you know, um, some teachers right now are currently teaching electives in addition to their core subjects, but then we have, which is why I was going to mention the two FTE, um, because that's, that is part of this conversation, um, then you hire those itinerant staff or um, staff at the site using uh, different funding to provide some of the services that currently um, some of our staff is providing now, and, and Heather, if there's any Thing that I'm missing, please feel free to jump in. Um, CBO Leslie again. I think, and I, I don't want to minimize it that it's an easy process because it's not. And because I, I, I personally have not engaged in master scheduling for like a high school or a middle school type program before. Um, this was something that was more of a challenge as we as we just really looked at it and we got immense support from Principal Mayberry, um, who has experience with this as we came up with that sample type schedule. Now, when you look at um, a comprehensive middle school as as just in itself, you end up with, um, you know, it's a little bit more spread out. So like right now, I mean, as opposed to that, looking at, you know, this is kind of their master schedule right now. I mean, you can see it's a lot of blocks, you know, for a lot of teachers all in one spot. And while you might need to serve those students, um, I guess, let me, let me phrase it a different way. When you're just looking at, you have this many students for like a fourth grade. And so you're going to need X amount of teachers. When you're looking at a whole um, comprehensive schedule, just for a comprehensive middle school, you end up kind of spreading those teachers out a little bit more. So like right now, um, we have 23 classes, periods. So it's not just a teacher, I have you know, X amount of students. It's each period, each teacher. So, I mean, you end up having these very large cross sections. So right now we have 23 class periods that have under 20 students in them. We have four um, periods with under 15 students in them. And we have two class periods with under 10 students in them. So as you begin to break that out and you kind of concentrate it on each individual TK-8 site, it really started to become apparent that we're able to kind of, you know, control that a little bit more without having to spread out, you know, kind of like spreading the butter over a piece of toast. It gets a little bit thinner, you know, um, and really between that and some other factors that uh, Superintendent Lucci discussed, that's where we're able to see that comparative to the staff that we have now and the staff that we would project out, that's where we saw the net savings of three FTE. I see Trustee Ross had her hand up. Um, thank you so much. This is Trustee Ross. I'm, to, to my understanding, then, what you're saying is because we have 53 students less, we can cut three certified FTE. It doesn't matter if we go TK through eight or if we stay as is. Either way, we can cut three certified FTE and we can move from unrestricted funds to restricted funds. It is, is that's that's what I'm hearing. Is that correct? No. I so how does it change if you, we have 53 less students regardless, how does that change? Whether we're middle I, school or I, I don't believe eight. I said regardless, we need to cut three FTE. I, 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 that is the explanation that I have that I just provided. Um, so I, I don't know of a different way in order to word that. Right. So it's and, and it is hard to conceptualize. So so if you if you look at our current TK, our current six eight model, and you see that we have um, 
all the electives and all of the um, the the um, smaller class sizes, right? And we still want to offer electives and that type of thing for students. And then you take the students and you distribute them among, um, amongst the district. Um, when we made the workup model, we came up with two FTE per subject per grade level. And I'm also going to tell you what we presented tonight was the, um, you know, keeping six through eight as it is now at EB Kane, because if we don't have the enrollment for sixth grade, we would have to look to potentially going back to EB Kane's former cohort model. Um, so that was something I didn't work up in a mock-up because that's not really the direction we, um, we wish to go for programs. Um, but, you know, that is something that we will have to keep in consideration depending upon enrollment. Um, so when we took the students and we um, divided them amongst uh, the school sites as we, um, you know, are projecting um, the the, atten the, uh, the enrollment at those sites, um, and we worked out that mock, we came up with three, having three FTE over what we currently have now. Now, yes, we do have some low class sizes. Some of those are an elective. Some periods are low and other periods are not at the middle school model right now. And like Heather said, you know, um, the master schedule is quite a beast to work on um, at a middle school level. And um, having the itinerant electives will take some of the load off of the FTE that we have that teach those core subjects. I think one of the questions that I heard Trustee Ross asking was, let's just take the two certificated FTE that could be moved to a different um, funding source, supplemental and concentration, or some other block grant. Could that not, could those staff not be shifted in a in our current comprehensive middle school model? So um, speaking of the block grant, or really it's it's the, the prop money that we have um, for band, and that's where I put that, um, that, potential funding source was for a band or for an itinerant music teacher, we cannot supplant those funds. And so the way to utilize those funds for this model would be that we would have an additional music teacher that would do something different than what our band director is doing now um, at the middle school. Um, if we don't change the model, then what we would be doing could be considered supplanting, which is why we haven't um, looked into utilizing those funds currently at our middle school. That and the, the fact that we can't, you know, we don't have the students at the middle school right now that would utilize band. Now, if you went to the KK8 model and we had that additional music teacher, so we already have VAPA, right? And and we believe in keeping our VAPA model because we know that it's good for our TK5 students, but, you know, for those seamless transi tra transitions as in our strate strategic plan, um, we, we want to um, support student transitions. So then we have that music teacher to support as well. And could there be um, a, additional classes? Could we have um, more of a vocals class or, you know, what, what do kids want? And this is where getting on the ground and talking to students is going to be helpful when we're looking at these particular funds and these restricted sources. Um, what do students want, right? Um, then we can look at the funds and apply that. Some of this has to be done through the LCAP as well. So we have the idea to utilize the funds through the supplemental concentration funds through the LCAP plan. So then when we go out to get the feedback from the community and the staff and the students, you know, is are the programs that we're thinking will work for the TK8 students going to work for our students? Do they want those programs? And so that's something that we will keep in mind. Um, and just being able to offer um, you know, world languages at each site and that type of thing, because we're moving to an itinerant model where we can provide access to students. You know, it doesn't mean that we only provide those resources or services for 6-8. In a TK model, you can do more if students want more. Um, I uh, taught fifth grade for many years and I had students who were interested in band. So the band teacher would pull them and they would go do band with the sixth grade students. He had space in that class. So that's some of the, the um, opportunities you have in a TK model now. We have a current middle school model and we have access to electives and that type of thing. But when you're asking me about, you know, what would a TK model look like in our district? 
you know, this is the information I'm, I'm giving you. So if I could take the example of the, um, uh, the arts block grant where we, we cannot supplant, um, or it's music, it's a music block grant. I think it, um, it, isn't it, it's a proposition. So, so <laughs> essentially that grants. means we cannot take, um, I'm trying to pick on Mr. Kepfer, we, as our existing music teacher, we cannot, um, say we're going to pay for his salary out of this grant because he's already part of our staff and already provides music classes. Correct. Um, that's yeah. actually the, uh, the, so there's two, to, just to make it confusing, there's two yeah. art um, funding sources that have come up. So last year we got the arts music instructional discretionary block grant. Um, and that is uh, one time and also tied to a plan. So we already have the plan in place for that and that those funds will expire. Um, the new one is the proposition 28 arts and music funding that was uh, voted on recently. So as that's starting to come in, that is the one that um, Superintendent Lucci Garcia is referring to that is has the supplement, not supplant. So that's okay. that's the one that's, and that's ongoing funding. You cannot supplant. You cannot supplant with so, that. So since we already have a music teacher, even with our current model of a um, conference of middle school, if you wanted to bring in an additional music teacher who taught younger grades, that could be paid for with the grant. Well, or, we, so we have a VAPA model right now, and and I and I feel like we're getting really deep into, um, into the what could happen. But I I just want to make it clear that the goal would be to provide something through the arts that we're not currently doing, and then use that funding source to fund that. We haven't um, had that opportunity yet because we already provide so many. Um, programs. You know, we have our VAPA program and then we have our electives at our, our middle school. But again, what could we do with that money and how could we provide the electives not only to our sixth through eighth grade students, but to younger students who may be interested as well? Yeah. And I don't mean to get into the weeds too much, but I'm trying to understand, can we make a similar shift without going TK8? Can we, can we use a similar strategy um, of shifting some of the staff funding to the restricted funding sources without having to implement a TK-8 model. So I haven't been able to do that as of yet because we have programs that we're already implementing. And so um, it's going to take some more time and some creativity to, um, to figure that out. And I have not had that opportunity yet this year, nor did I last year. Um, but, you know, what, whatever the board decides today, we will implement the board's decision. Okay, um, I guess the last point that I wanted to make about um, this dollar amount um, is that I appreciated that um, her, um, uh, Ms. Dutro indicate that this is you know about 2.5% of our um, total unrestricted budget that one of my main concerns is that this is a relatively small amount of money to cut um, in order, or the, the impacts could be, sorry, I'm, I'm, I need to work on my wording there. Um, this is a um, an incredibly impactful decision that could cause um, boundary changes for our attendance lines. Um, it, it displaces kids who are currently at middle school and getting a lot out of their program and completely upends our district for a relatively modest savings, which could be decreased further by people leaving the district. I mean, every 10 kids who decide that they don't want to go back to their home elementary school as a seventh grader, they're walking away all, um, with $100,000 out of our budget. So I just, I'm, I know it's really difficult to identify sources that you can cut from our um, general fund and it's an incredibly difficult task. I'm just wondering if we have considered it, um, how incredibly uh, negative the impacts could be for a relatively modest decrease. And if all, if we really have considered all the options, I mean, I heard Ms. Paris give us this example of um, can some of these savings be realized with this kind of like five to eight kind of Weimar type model I've had people come up with all sorts of ideas. Um, I've even heard people say, maybe we need to be going farther and we need to go down to two schools, um, which I, I'm hopeful that we're not there yet. But um, I recognize how important it is that we become solvent, but I'm just wondering if there 
are other ways to get there that would not be quite as um, disruptive to our student population and wouldn't cause further, further enrollment losses. Um, so CBO Leslie, again, I'll just kind of touch on that. Um, and I know that you were in attendance in quite a lot of the um, budget committee and FRIP committee meetings um, of which multitudes of um, other ideas were explored and discussed. Um, you know, a lot of times when you start looking at a very separated grade configurations, and in fact, I think we even um, spoke about, you know, uh, separating out grades to each individual site, which didn't seem to, um, seems great, um, you know, at first until you start taking into consideration that you could have three children at three different sites, um, depending on the grades. And um, also, you know, um, schools up the hill, they um, their grade model changes just depending on how much room they have at their two small schools. Um, but when we really got into it, we're still looking at attendance boundary adjustments. We're still looking at, you know, uh, you know, are we gonna overfill at certain sites? We're still gonna be looking at transportation concerns. Um, we're still gonna have that holistically. Um, whereas we're still in the position where we need to address the fact that we have a reducing population um, of our middle school students, I think was what brought the budget committee in the first place to that conclusion. And I just want to remind the board that we do have about 140 students that are attending Loomis schools for the TK-8, and that's just one district. So I just, you know, I I, I understand that we, um, you know, we don't want to lose students. We want to get students back. And that's absolutely been what we've been talking about since I've been here. But, you know, we also have students that are attending different districts looking for that TK-8 model. We have such a mix in our community, and um, I, I have, I've heard from um, families on either side of it. Um, I think the survey results are pretty compelling about how much people want middle school. And I think one of the challenges is, is that until your kids are there, you may not appreciate what a middle school can offer and that your kid may need something um, different and more advanced. So, um, I mean, I, I last year had proposed um, TK-8 as a possibility just because I was trying to put like every option I could consider on the table and was really, I, I really struggled with how to um, go down to three schools and how to implement that. Um, and, and, and so I, I've gone through that exercise and um, I just, I, I think we heard from the FRIP committee. I think we've heard from the committee, the community through the survey. Um, that there is a lot of value to our, our middle school model. And um, so I just wanna recognize that because I know I've, I've talked about both approaches and I can see the value to, to each. I just, I still am trying to figure out if there's a way to realize some of these cost savings while continuing the way that we are with, with our current, um, current model. I mean, we could, I guess I, I'm still the three FTE. It seems like that it's a, it's a staffing challenge when you have fewer students arrive than, than expected. Um, but couldn't that be something that we work on in the upcoming year is to, is to have a better match between those two numbers? I know it's not, I know it's not easy. It, uh, can you, I, I'm, I'm not sure I understand what you're asking me. Um, when we talk about, um, we, we are overstaffed at the middle school. Um, that was a result of 50 something students not mm -hmm. um, showing up that they had maybe committed to us or that there was some communication that they would be coming and then they, they don't end up enrolling in our schools. Um, I, I know that there are strategies that our staff are employing to try to minimize that gap such as following up with families over the summer, trying to have communication so that we are well aware of who's going to enroll. But I mean, are, what are, are there strategies that we can use so that we are appropriately staffed so that we um, aren't paying, aren't overstaffed for teachers mm -hmm. and having these smaller class sizes? I mean, that seems like kind of a management issue. Uh, like maybe we, if, if that is a trend that, that the numbers don't tend to come to fruition for the middle school, then maybe it's about 
um, coming in somewhat, I don't like the idea of this, but coming in somewhat understaffed and then staffing up as needed to meet the level of enrolled students? Coming in understaffed isn't, is not my priority. It, it's that, that would not be, um, that would be very detrimental to our schools to come in understaffed and then to add people. First of all, there's, um, there's a prime time to recruit right? So when, when we're going out to recruit, we're starting, um, you know, in, in the spring, right? Um, once you start recruiting, if, if you start school and then you recruit, everybody has a job. And if people are still looking for a job, that's great. We get lucky, but you heard people say tonight that we're still looking for staff at our middle school, um, which is, it's been hard to staff, um, so, so there's that with recruiting. Um, we did not anticipate to come in 53 students less this year. That's not, that was not part of our projection. Um, 53 students is significant. Um, and so when you come in with that few students, when the year starts and you have the staff and the master schedule built out for um, your projected enrollment, then, then you end up with smaller class sizes in some instances. So uh, as far as it being, it's absolutely our job as management to project. And that's what we brought you today, some projections. Uh, we do the best we can to get down to the dollar and get down to the, the number of staff that we need. But students and families do what students and families need to do. And if they if 53 students don't show up, there's nothing I can do about that when the school year begins. We do promote, we do um, have... You know, uh, HR has had multiple hiring fairs and attended them as well. Um, our HR technician is uh, on the phone calling and recruiting constantly. That's why we have, we now have a vice principal and such. So, you know, what th th it, it's a great question. And it's a question I think that many districts across the state and even the country are asking, how, do, how can we staff better, right? But we have to project and we have to staff to those projections. And then when the students come or they don't come, then we have to um, figure out what the next steps are. Uh, if, you know, if more students come than we anticipate, then we do have to recruit and hope we get students. If fewer students come, we already have the teachers in place. Yeah, it just seems so. like it makes more sense to me that you, it would, you could be more efficient with your staffing if you had those staff on one site rather than disperse across three sites. Sure. Okay. okay. Right. Understood. Okay. Anyone else have any questions? I have a question, Trustee Ross. Um, first, I do want to thank you, uh, Superintendent, because I know this is nothing we've ever done as a group. So it's it's all new. It's all a research project. So I do have to tell you that I really appreciate your efforts and what you have done and what you've contributed to our solution. Um, so thank you very much. And, and Heather Leslie, thank you as well. Um, what I did hear you say is that you haven't had enough time to come up with other solutions. And I believe that teachers and parents and staff are also saying they, that it's just not been enough time to think about what we're actually doing. And if we could give you the ability to take the time to find several solutions, then possibly we don't have to go through this in most this impactful decision. So do you feel like if you had more time, you would be able to come up with other solutions to this problem? So the board asked me to present the model of what a TKA would look like today. And what I said earlier on is I didn't have the time to plan an entire year out because I did this in three weeks and I'm projecting. Um, if we had, um, once the board makes a decision, whatever that decision is, then we spend the rest of the school year, like we always do, planning for the next school year. Um, so in terms of how many solutions and possibilities, I'm sure that we could come up with many. I know that the FRIP came up with many. Um, some of those were the, the Weimar model. Some of those were um, the Placer Hills model and determined that that wasn't going to work for us financially. So what I brought to you was what the board had approved 
back when the budget committee made the recommendations and the board approved them. And the reason why I brought that to you is that the board approved that. So I'm not coming to you with all the ideas of all the ways that we could create a different model. You asked me to propose budget reductions. I took the work that had been done before I was ever in the seat. The hard work that I've been hearing people say they did the hard work and no one listened. And I brought that back to the forefront. And then I was asked to put together a detailed plan, which is here before you today. And, and so if this is the detailed plan, then I think there are several details that we left off that may be super crucial, like right. special education and how this will affect SPED, especially if we set boundaries and people with IEPs need to be bussed in. Um, that's going to add a whole different element of, of funding that we have to come up with. Um, I, I can respond to that if you'd like. Wow. So we currently have programs in each of our sites for our students with disabilities and the programs are at the sites based on the need of the sites. So what, what the process is, is that the special education department and the team determines what the need is, where the students are and that type of thing. And then we do bus students. So that is part of our, uh, of our practice already. We have a specialized bucket of money for that. Um, and it's something that we anticipate will, um, we will need to continue to do. So the, the way we serve our students with disabilities, it, it's not, it only changes to the need of the program and the need of the students. It, we're not going to serve students less or in a more expensive way because of what our model is. We're going to serve our students in the way that the special ed department, um, which is all of the staff that makes up that department, and the parents that sit in the IEP meetings and make decisions with the principals um, on how to best serve students um, with those staff members as well. So um, the way we handle special ed is not going to change. Programs will move around from site to site based on need and what resources are available at those programs. And there will be a cost to serve our students with disabilities. And we anticipate that. And um, within that, like right now we have, we have, we're having a really hard time finding SPED teachers. And we have one center at Evie Kane specifically for our sixth, seventh, and eighth graders, which is very different from our first through kindergarten SPED classes. So we will actually have to expand or if we're setting boundaries, bus people in. Where does that money come from? If our special ed doesn't have enough in that account, where does that financially come from? So um, on the slide with the buckets, I did show you a bucket of money that um, is dedicated to serve our students with disabilities. But as you know, um, the general fund does pay for um, some of those services currently. So I think we pay, I, I think we pay um, into it as much as we receive, right? So our budget <clears throat> is double and we get half the money. Is that accurate? Um, yes, it's accurate. So um, sorry, CBO Leslie, I gotta remember to do that every time. Um, I mean, could there be expenses from busing middle school students to a middle school site for service for special education? Yes. Could that also be balanced with savings of, uh, you know, an elementary student that no longer needs to be bused to a different site as well? Yes. Um, again, it's really hard to determine exactly how much we would expend on busing. Um, and I, I know it, it echoes, and I'm sure you're, you've said it ad nauseum, you know, it really depends on um, the students, um, where they're located at, and what their needs are. Uh, we also have a lot of special education students that we don't have the resources, resources for that we refer out to Placer County Office of Education or to non-public schools. Um, that varies greatly from year to year. So it really will depend on the special education enrollment at that time, but the programs, as she said, you know, to serve them and the cost to transport them will always kind of be steady. And thank you for that answer. I understood that. Um, but it's also the teacher, right? Because do, do you have to have a different, can you put sixth, seventh, eighth grade students with SPED in the first through fifth grade classrooms or is that a separate program? That would be a separate program. So we would have to develop that program at each school not necessarily. We don't. We we don't have um, our programs are different at each school right now. So it it just depends on the number of students that need to be served and what the resources are at that school and what the special ed team decides. Okay. 
Okay. So we would basically be shifting it our even our special ed programs would be shifting around, moving around, new things would be happening, not just our general ed, but also our special ed programs. Correct. Everything's shifting around for what's needed. Just verifying. It just depends on if we have to shift. So again, I'm going to go back to, you know, what the students needs are and what the programs are that we need to run. Um, I've been asked by families about what gate or advanced options might look like. And I, I don't know that I saw, I, I know I saw the kind of the laundry list of these are the things we'll continue offering, but how would advanced math, for example, work? What are your thoughts on how to um, continue to offer that differentiated, those differentiated options? So I have to be really clear about this because we offer di differentiated, um, you know, in instruction to students of all grade levels, um, and that and that's part of what our teachers are trained to do. They offer students the you know um, the level of um, instruction that they need to meet the state standards. I understand so, that, and so I see, when you I look see at, that. But so, we have so when, a different sorry. program at the middle school level, though, correct? Where you're it's not just like a seventh grade math class where there's differentiation. There's a, a sub, there are completely different tracks. And and just real quick point of order, let's just try not to interrupt. Okay, let her continue her thought please and then, then clarify and vice versa. Thank you. Um, so you mentioned gate and, and I wanna separate the two because our gifted learners require a different type of instruction. Um, they have different needs sometimes than our students who, um, who may be advanced or they could be advanced and gifted. They may be gifted and have different um, needs for instruction. And that's something that we're working on with the gate committee, what gifted and talented education looks like in our classrooms. Um, so when you look at the needs of a gate student, there are pullout programs there are push-in programs, there's um, differentiation for gifted learners within a classroom. Differentiation can absolutely happen in every grade level. And while um, it would be harder to create um, extra classes for advanced learners, absolutely advanced learners could learn at the advanced level within their classroom. So, you know, it, it's going to be about how we approach that and not whether or not we can do it. Um, we currently have what we call MTSS meetings, so multi-tiered systems of support. The multi-tiered part is that we serve students who um, who ha who have a variety of um, learning needs because we know that that's how we all come, right? We all have our strengths and the areas that we need to improve on. And so our teachers in those MTSS meetings work with the principal to discuss student by student what the need is. If there's a need for, you know, um, to figure out um, how to resolve having um, a large number of advanced students receive advanced um, instruction, then we as a team tackle that need. So there are a, there are a variety of ways to um, instruct classrooms full of students that have that particular need. But for all intents and purposes, we do provide differentiation within each of the grade levels. But I'm also hearing you say it wouldn't look the way it looks today. Say that it, again. I'm sorry. For the, I, it, for, there's for, some kind of an echo. I have. I'm having a hard time hearing. So I am too. Okay. Um, taking middle school math math as an example, it would not be offered in the same way at a TK8 program because it sounds like you're saying that it would be all eighth graders taking math together. There would be differentiation within the class, but there wouldn't be a separate class for advanced um, math learners in eighth grade. And, that, and that's the model that I did present tonight, but, but I, I'm going to tell you now that um, when when the principals have an opportunity to sit down and weigh in on what this looks like at their site, they're going to have different ideas, right? And so the, this is the point where, you know, what, what, so I, and I know I say this and I know it, it causes distress, but I'm going to say it again. Um, whatever model the board chooses, we're going to implement to the best of our ability in the most efficient and effective way for our students. That is that I've been saying that for years right? That is absolutely what we're going to do. Um, how we do it is going to be, um, some of how we do it is going to take some team effort and um, some creativity, absolutely. And I heard um, Ms. Paris today say, you know, be part of the solution. I absolutely can tell you that our principal team and our leadership team, um, Kelly Young and um, 
all of our people that uh, serve students at the department level are absolutely interested in providing the best education to our students. So, so again, I'm not saying that there's not going to be an opportunity for advanced learning in our in a TK8 model. I am saying that that we'll have to look at what the numbers are, what the need is, but that's through the MTSS process. And our MTSS teams meet um, at the K-5 level trimesterly and um, Principal Mayberry is getting those meetings up and running at her site. Um, and so I, I assuming she's meeting quarterly, but I, I have to check in with her to make sure, but she is meeting regularly with her teachers and she knows what the data is. So we would take a look at that and we would um, bring the academics to the students that need them, at, to the level that the students need them. Um, to your point about engaging principals and other staff in coming up with solutions, um, I understand that we have some teachers who have taught in a TK-8 model before or you know, even within our own district. So um, I think that there's a lot of people in our school community that would be eager to help with the planning beyond just working Absolutely. with the principals. I mean, and and really that's the best way to implement anything is through coll collaboration. Absolutely. You know, um, when the board asks me for a model and I'm putting it together for you in a month, you know, really less than a month, the amount of collaboration that's available is limited compared to, oh, here's our model now and it's November, let's move forward and start talking about how we can collaborate that, you know, that's, I mean, that's two different things, right? So that's why I said projected and mock-up. I'm using that language to make it very clear to everybody that the collaboration piece on whatever the board decides comes next. I, I just think I'm hearing people in the community say that they want a little bit more time to investigate options before and, and have more kind of collaboration and discussion prior to voting on on a model. Well, and, and if I could interject, I, I, I think that's more of a, a concern for the board, less for the, the superintendent, um, as far as the time needed to, to consider a decision on the model. So I um, just want to kind of steer it there. Um, Could you clarify what you mean by that? Yes, as far as uh, the community would like more time or they're, they're asking for potentially more time, um, this is an issue that the board asked the superintendent to bring to us. She didn't pick the time to choose, you know, to, to put it on the agenda. That's something that we've been asking. So that, that's what I mean by that. No, I understand. We And we we did ask. Um, we knew that we hadn't cut enough last year, and so we needed to make further cuts. So we asked the super interim superintendent to propose cuts to us. But I guess what I'm trying to understand is what is our time frame that we have to make a decision? I've, obviously, we want as much time to plan for implementation as possible. Well, well, but I think we're trying to make the cuts as of so that they could be implemented um, fall 24, 25. So does it, I don't know that it has to be made tonight. Um, at our last board meeting, one of the things we discussed was playgrounds. Um, and the timeline given to us was that would have to be made to tonight, essentially, in order to get those ordered, get through the approval process and permitting and all the rest to have those constructed in time for school to start in August. So that that's what I understand that time constraint is, um, would be to get playgrounds on the campus that we would need for our TK through five, you know, and then the six, seven, eight over to EVK. Okay. I think I would prefer not to let the playgrounds dictate our timeline because there's so many other variables to consider. Um, this is... This is Trustee Grigsby. What was the timeline for our letter of growing, growing concern? Because I know that that's like the detrimental thing right there is that we're in fiscal crisis. What, do you remember what the timeline that um, Superintendent Gabalito Mojio gave us? Um, CDO Leslie here again. Um, if I recall um, directly, and I would need to pull it up, I don't think that there was a time limit specifically. I think more to the point is because we are under a letter of going concern um, that um, we're showing that we're making those strides toward that so we can avoid um, having a fiscal advisor assigned to our district. Um, again, just as a reminder, fiscal advisor is different than the fiscal expert. So a fiscal advisor would be the one assigned by the County Office of Education to have a stay and rescind authority over any board decisions that involve fiscal matters.
Um, this is Trustee Ross. I do have two more questions, if you don't mind. Um, I remember when we were trying to put up shade structures at EV Kane, and we had an issue, something was with um, making sure currently ADA appliant, uh, compliant, excuse me. Um, how have things changed? How can all of a sudden we can get a playground, but we couldn't get a play, we couldn't get a shade structure. So how has the ADA compliance changed or how are we going to be able to even put in a playground? Um, CBO Leslie again, um, as discussed um, at the last board meeting, um, as we looked at how can we implement shade structures and, and we had discussed already that, you know, we were trying to move forward with as many shade structures as possible by utilizing the ESSER funds. Um, by utilizing the ESSER funds and installing those, it's kind of like a two for one. So we're able to make the ADA accessible improvements by utilizing those restricted one-time funds. And in doing so, then we're able to install a playground with the reduced cost there, um, also from restricted funds. Um, the second piece of that is where we were looking at, I know we'd had the discussion of where we were looking at putting a playground and for what use when we were looking at putting our dependent charter on that site. It was because of the type of usage and because it was for a completely different type of program that changed the placement of the playground. So if it would have been a, a lot more challenging, um, if not nearly impossible to implement that in that scenario. So um, kind of to parlay it off of that, um, choosing to put it in like the proposed site that um, Principal Mayberry had placed on her, um, you know, sample um, example map um, would eliminate a majority of the ADA accessibility issues than, you know, if it were just for an Alta Vista program up top. And then again, it could parlay off of the shade structure improvements as well. Thank you for that answer. Um, my second question would be, we just hired I, I'm sorry, I don't know the exact number, like 30 something single subject teachers for EV Kane. Will those teachers still be able to, um, will we still be able to use single subject credentials or do we now have to have multiple subject credentials? How is that gonna work? So we are looking at keeping the current 6-8 model where we have de departmentalized um, teachers teaching our students. But again, like I said earlier, if we don't have the enrollment um, for a sixth grade, then we may have to look to a cohort model. That's not what we wish to do. Um, so we'll have to keep an eye on our numbers, um, our, our enrollment, um, and try to uh, hopefully have enough students that we don't have to move to a cohort model. Have we looked at the students and where they would return to as boundaries or not yet because no boundaries have been set? We have not set the boundaries yet. Um, if the board decides to implement this model, then we will, um, as I showed you in the one slide, you know, that, that kind of flow of work, then we will initiate that connection and take a look at those boundaries. So as of right now, we don't know how many sixth grade students we'd have at Auburn Elementary or how many sixth grade students we'd have at E.B. Kane compared to how many sixth grade students we've had at Sky Ridge. We, won't, we don't know that information. Um, so we projected some numbers and it's, it's on one of the slides, um, that I shared with you in the board packet, but we overall are looking to keep the six, eight departmentalized model. That's the ultimate goal. If we have to switch to a cohort, it'll be because we don't have enough students to continue with that model. One of the concerns I hear from the community is that um, we've had two schools closed, we've had families displaced one year, and then we're talking about very significant changes in the second year. And so, um, you know, like, for example, there's a, a student I know here who was at Alta Vista, has come to Sky Ridge, is doing well, but um, would likely, given where their address is, be moved to Kane the following year. And this is actually applies to my own kids too, probably, but um, so that's three schools in three years. And I'm just wondering how we could approach this in a way that minimizes that sort of disruption for people. And also thinking about um, if there's a way, it's probably two separate questions, but it's about minimizing disruption. So in, in terms of being forced to move, even though we have school of choice still, but I think we're gonna really struggle to get younger students to Kane um, as a TK-8. And then the other piece is how to, 
can we consider a gradual implementation of this? Um, for example, allowing the students at Kane to finish their, their time in middle school and without being displaced. Um, so I, I'm really struggling with the concept that you think that families won't want to take their kids to Kane. I think Kane is a wonderful school. They have a wonderful principal who will um, welcome students into her family. Um, a, a wonderful staff who welcomes students. Um, we heard tonight several public comments about um, how great it is at Kane. So I really struggle when I hear those words. It, it, that's hard. Um, I know that whatever model the board um, chooses that our principals and our staff will work hard to welcome kids. So I just want to say, I, I, I have to say that because I feel like our schools are, you know, they, they provide that, um, that welcome. Um, um, so I, that, that was I, one I question. Sorry, I, I, I am not maligning Kane when I say that I'm okay. saying that you already have, um, you already have established elementary schools and it's a lot easier to buy into something that's already established than it is to be part of a cohort that's starting. I mean, we saw this when we discussed Depends. bringing Alta Vista to E.B. Right. Kane. There was, um, you know, some trepidation from families about whether, I'm just saying you are starting a new program for students in grades TK5 at, at a site. Well, and if, and if, if, I, I, if I could step in there, though, it would be with many of the same staff and teachers that we have right now at our other sites. Right. So it'd be the same professionals, the same people who have taught older siblings, who have taught parents in some cases, um, that would be standing up that that program. So it's not like it'd be totally brand new from scratch. Uh, you know, there's a, a, a critical difference between what we're discussing tonight and the idea of moving Alta Vista to that campus. In that case, we were looking at having the the middle school model on its own as a separate being, as a separate entity, and then also a TK through five charter at the back of the campus. So I, I think there's some critical distinctions there. Um, so it's no matter how it goes, it's not it's not an easy call. Uh, you know, there's so many different factors that, that play into it. Um, but I'll defer to you. It seems like you still had some questions. Oh no, I'm just asking how we can minimize disruption, how we can consider a gradual implementation. Um, I, I'm I'm glad that you're feeling so hopeful about the ability to attract families to a, a new a new site. I, I I don't know that we have necessarily heard from our community about. I don't think we've asked people specifically um, how they would feel about being told you've now been assigned to this different school. Your your kid's doing well at this other school, but we're asking you to move again. Well, I, I'm sure that each one of us have had that conversation though with with a number of parents, right? And and folks in the community. I, I know I have, um, I've been getting phone calls about it. You know, people asking me to, to at least to talk through it, right? This goes, there There are concerns there and moving uh, moving your kid who's currently established, you know, at one site. And then if we're over capacity to, to move to EV Kane and ask them to do that, that's that's certainly something people would wrestle with. And I think it it, it could be difficult. It'll be a, it could be a scary change just like every changes, but it would become normal, right? So, you know, eventually that that would be normalized. And we would be asking a lot of the people doing it right now. And the people in the first year, we'll be asking a, a lot of them, of the staff and of the students and families to trust us, to trust our school, to trust their administrators, to trust our teachers, that we will still take care of their students and we'll provide those opportunities for them. Um, there's There's a lot that we want. There's a lot that a community wants. I I spoke strongly earlier this year in favor of keeping the comprehensive middle school model because of some of the concerns you raised tonight about uh, the advanced math programs, about the advanced science programs, things like that. But but there comes a point where it does get down to what we can afford, and where the financial aspect comes into it. Um, yeah. You know, now, at risk of going back to the playgrounds, I just want to clarify something on that, and that's. The on the map we looked at were those ones, the lower ones for the older kids at EV Kane. Were those on the grass field or were those up on the blacktop? On the blacktop. Okay. Thank you. Um, and and I'm sorry, folks, but I, I do need to use the restroom again. So uh, okay. I'd like to take a five minute recess. It's uh, 10 01. Let's round up to 10 02 um, and be back in here at 10 07, please. Okay.
All right, it is 10.07, so we are back in session. Thank you, everybody, for your patience. All right, and we're continuing with questions uh, about the proposal. I have a few questions. Um, can we go back to the slide deck again? Um, it would be the current enrollment uh, number 31 on that. All right, thank you. So looking at this, um, so I'm gonna kind of approach this from kind of a, a talk about some different, a little bit differently from the uh, majority of the discussion tonight. So if we look at on um, from 2019-20, going down to 24-25 school year for <laughs> TK-5, um, that difference is 112 students. Now, if you take that same year, 2019-20 um, from 670 students from six through eight down to 24, 25, 454 students, that is almost double 216 students, which poses a question. Um, we're obviously, if we keep this trend up, we've been losing enrollment double the rate from six to eight to TK through five. So when does it come to a point where the school will not be a solvent to support itself with students? Do we have a rough idea on that? DBO Leslie and I um, had that conversation and um, it looks like she's crunching some numbers over there. Um, um, well, yeah, that that was part of uh, part of the some of the work we put into um, the considerations. But I we can get back to you with that with okay. that figure. May well, I may I interject while CBO Leslie is crunching the numbers? When I actually look at the full um, spectrum of the data provided here, if you start with um, 2011 and you look at the percent change from TK five from um, the first year to now, so um, as someone else mentioned earlier tonight. Um, Overall, our elementary school enrollment has um, declined by 30%, and our middle school has declined by 38%, if you calculate the percent change. So I just want to call that out, that yes, there have been some... No, I, I, school, I, that's but, why... But I pick... overall, they're fairly, they're in the, the same realm. So, but but you're taking from the whole list right there, okay, from 2011-12 from down to 24 20 for down to 24 25 Since so anyways i want to kind of carry on my point here what i want to get at so that's a concern for me and um so another concern it was actually a comment uh last board meeting um and the comment was that uh let me find it here that uh so ev kane is one of the feeder schools into Placer High. And the comment was that uh, that um, the students coming from E.B. Kane into Placer High seemed to be doing better than the other feeder schools. So it got me to kind of do some research on that. And um, if you go to the, it's the CASP. Um, Excuse me, Vice President Wedge. It seems like you're kind of getting away from the asking questions right now. Yes. Um, I don't mean inject it. No, I'm going to get to it. Piece. So I just want to try to keep us right now and clarify correct, questions correct. about the material that's been presented. And I'm getting to that. Um, so my concern on that, you know, going back to, you know, Evie Kane is the, is the continue enrollment count. And then also when we're looking at the, when we look at the test scores on, um, for Evie Kane, for one, they're, they're lower than any other um, school in the area and that's a concern you know even well below um, you know state standards at this point so and even when you're looking at the other surrounding middle schools in Placer County um, we are well below in academics than um, than the other middle schools and then even when we look at the surrounding K through eight schools 
academically, they're doing surprisingly very well. So, so that is my concern on that is um, just the history over EV Kane, the history of the enrollment we're seeing, and the history of just the uh, test uh, the test scores, you know, continually being. Um, you know, one of the lowest in the areas, lowest in the district and, you know, below state standards. And, and another, this, this board has made some hard decisions. We've actually, this year, we've done a really good job of actually um, closing a school, you know, last year, you know, something that was, that can was kicked down the road and that should have been made many, many years ago. So my main concern right now is, is we need to make some hard decisions because, because I'm concerned if we don't make a hard decision now, we may be forced to make a decision in a short matter of two, three years down the road, you know, to close EV Kane or or to go to some other kind of model, you know, at that point. And so I think this discussion is a worthy discussion to be having, you know, going through a K through eight model. It, it appears to me that is the best direction with the time that we have right now to go into and. Um, so those are some of my concerns and some of the data that I've been pulling up myself um, over these last uh, couple of weeks. Um, CBO Leslie, if I could just jump in really quick, I'm sorry, and um, kind of go back to, as you talked about, the um, approximate same decline um, that we see in um, the TK5 as versus to the six through eight. And, and that is, that's absolutely correct. However, we were able to then kind of address that um, through the closure of an elementary school because we'd had such a decline, we had the ability to close an elementary school and kind of, you know, right size ourselves in, in that way. Um, and then as we start talking about, you know, when it is it viable, typically when you open a school, you wanna have about 400 students. Um, and 400 students will usually is kind of the gauge, you know, at least, you know, you're going to have that coming up or about when you might have that. So you can construct a school or build a school um, is, is the gauge used. That way the students and the, um, the funding that's generated from them kind of equates the cost of an administrator, um, you know, all the supplemental services, everything else that goes along with that. Um, that said, um, so uh, you know, about 400 students is where we're going to start to see that is it really paying for itself. The thing that we're going to be challenged with is if we hit that point, um, we're going to have to then consider, do we just, you know, close out that model and spread those students out? And then we're going to start having a little bit of an impact, but again, not enough to then just open up another site because then we're going to still have the same problem. And so we're just kind of in that 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 strange spot right now where, uh, you know, that's why we start looking at how can we better spread these students out throughout our district and still be able to maintain the same type of sites. That's why I'm so intrigued by what Ms. Paris said earlier about the possibility of um, moving perhaps fifth grade students or that, that that model could alleviate some of the pressure on the elementary sites and then have a, a larger population at the middle school and also provide some of the opportunities we've talked about, about offering sports at a younger age or offering electives at a younger age. Um, the, the only thing that I can speak to is um, from the past, well, I, I've been here just over two years. So the past two years of discussions of, you know, alternative models um, and throughout the multiple committee processes that we've had, um, that still became something that was of a concern for everyone. And I think for the same reasons that you had already mentioned of, you know, the trepidation of, uh, you know, parents sending their elementary students onto a full middle school campus. I think that we already have some of that at our sixth grade level. Um, I, the feedback that we had gotten previously is that that would not be something that a majority of the parents would look at to send their fifth grader to a majoritively comprehensive middle school campus. Um, that was just out of the last two years of committees though. So um, if there's new and different information um, in the last you know, couple of months, I'm not aware. You might be willing to do it if it saved the middle school for the, the for their kids' future. But um, I wanted to quickly address the test scores. I just, I think it's really important that when we look at our test scores, we there's a lot of nuance within it because the test scores vary widely depending on which subset of students you're looking at. Um, some of our students are performing at a very high level and um, others are performing at lower levels. And um, I, I just think that it's important, whoever's test scores you're looking at, that you're overlaying 
more characteristics about the student population. I think we tend to serve um, the highest proportion of um, students in poverty, students who are in learning English, student, we have a high percentage of students um, with disabilities. So I, I just think there's a lot of context that's needed when you're looking at, at test scores. Yeah, um, I'm not going to get, you know, that's that I don't think that's something we need to really debate tonight. Just the, the information that we're not talking, you know, five, 10 percent, you know, we're talking, you know, upwards, you know, 25, 30 percent. It's a big gap there. And. Um, and that was that's the only reason why I brought it up, because if it was a, a short gap, I understand what you're saying, but it's a big gap. We're talking, you know, 20, 30 percent, you know, gap, you know, from from E.V. Kane to other surrounding schools. Um, I do just want to contact private schools are a lot different than public schools and those test comparisons. That's that's <laughs> our academic gap. That is the that's the problem we're having to solve right now. Um, and I also wanted to address what you said, um, because when we were looking at consolidating our schools, I met with the counselor of Platinum High School, I met with the principal of the time, I met with the librarian, and I met with several Trustee Ross, I think we lost you. Thanks. This echo is killing me. Yeah, that echo, it's hard to hear. Okay, so until we get Trusty Ross back, once we get her back, we'll, we'll return to her, to her point. Um, are there any additional questions, clarifying questions on the material as well? I wanna just bring us back to our budget um, because we've talked about the need to cut 2.5 million. And I know that we cut, let's say 879,000 that was applied to 22-23. We've cut 110,000 for 23-24. So I was just hoping that CBO Leslie could kind of remind us of where we are because it seems like what we're hearing tonight is that if this change were to be made, that would suffice given the increased um, supplemental and concentration. But and if we could just put a pin on that quickly, it looks like we've got Trustee Ross back. Oh, she's back. Great. I apologize. Thank you so much for your patience with me. I really do appreciate this. Um, I'm not sure where we left off, but I just wanted to verify that I had spoken to multiple, multiple Placer High staff and educators, and they all overwhelmingly agreed that EV Kane students came in more prepared than any K through eight school. So that was what I read. That's the research I did. I never claimed it to be anybody else's. It's my own. And I, I highly suggest we all do our own research on this. And if you can help them uh, provide some data to back that up, that would be great because I mean, I've talked to multiple people as, as well and they've told me the same thing. But what I presented here tonight is actually data and actually facts, not off hearsay and what I've been told by other people. Okay, but the facts you also have to take in consideration, context, private school versus charter school versus public schools, community schools, these are all different. And so you have to be able to take that into consideration when you are using data as your reliable source. Sometimes quantitative and qualitative work better together. So just, I'm, this isn't the debate time, so I apologize. I just, maybe it's time to move on debate unless there's any more questions. Right, thank you, Trustee Ross. Let's move back to Clerk Brickler's question. I was just asking, I was asking for an update on what you're projecting needs to be cut. I keep hearing 2.5 million based on um, Dennis Snelling's language, which is slightly different. He's saying that um, it's in the presentation. He says that revenues will decline by 2.5 million beginning in 24, 25. And so I, I've been trying to keep the running tally of how much we've cut and what remains to be solvent. 
we had 879,000. That was the, the, um, the um, several staffing positions, um, a lot of admin staff, um, some um, unfilled positions and vacancies that wouldn't be filled. That was, um, and then that was 22, 23. There was 110,000 and 23, 24. Just trying to follow along with what more is needed in order to um, stop deficit spending. Um, thank you. So, um, you know, um, what Dennis and Ellie had looked at, um, of course, was, you know, essentially we were supposed to look at current status, but really um, the center of our FICMAT review and Dennis Snelling's review was almost um, a year ago of data, um, which I know we're all familiar with the fact that he was looking at stuff that was six months ago and with different projections and and different um, enrollment counts and things of that nature. So um, as we've talked about before, you know, it's, it's readily accepted from our County Office of Education that um, because of the decline of the revenues and the fact that, you know, we had, you know, not really decreased um, at that point, um, any additional things besides the anticipated closure of um, one of our elementary schools and um, discontinuing to uh, contribute to our dependent charter school, that we would need to make up that $2.5 million as a loss of revenues or, you know, loss of budget. So that's not really just like, we're going to dump $2.5 million and how much money we're going to get from the state. It's meaning that, you know, between what we're spending, we have that gap and what our normal revenues would be. So as we start looking at that holistically, I mean, and this is what we kind of talked about in the last meeting as well, is do I think that we actually need $2.5 million hard cash? County office is gonna tell you absolutely yes. Um, in fact, they'll tell you that if we wanna consider even increases for our staff, we need to cut more. Um, and I don't necessarily disagree with that because if you looked at, you know, our, our again, just a very general projection as of right now, this isn't our first interim finals. Um, we don't have certified data on our enrollment. So again, first interim is just a snapshot. Um, we really won't know how much money we're going to get until the end of the year, which is part of that budgeting process. But as we look at this, I mean, I can foresee that if we're able to um, net at, at a minimum what we've proposed as, you know, possible reductions as going to a TK-8 model um, district-wide, uh, we would be in a position where even if we had something that kind of swayed us one way or another in um, the next fiscal year, um, we would be clear of that structural deficit or deficit spending. Um, without it, just on the cuts that we've made right now, we're so close to that, that one, one tiny thing could really kind of push us back over into that. Um, I think where the county office is really looking is even as you start to continue that further out. Now, I can see as we gain more money, um, if if there are percentages of our unduplicated stay, we can net much more and concentrated. Um, however, that is going to be very restricted um, as we have to spend that money directly towards LCAP goals as determined by the district and the community or our school sites. Um, but it, it just it gets us out of that very scary spot. So if we're able to go there and very and even identify further cuts, continue to be judicious, um, making sure that we're making those staffing cuts as we see enrollment drop, things of that nature, I think that's what's really going to be able to, um, you know, get us through the next three or four years without having a um, qualified or negative budget. Anyone have questions about that? So you're saying that with what we've cut already, with a, a cut comparable to this $470,000, given that we have some, um, a, a, an increased unduplicated student count, that that might be enough for the time being? It, it's, it's my thought, yes. Now, again, come second interim, come original budget, everything can change. Um, it's always a moving target. And again, as, as we've discussed, you know, we've got some variances at the state level. I'm not really sure how that's going to look as far as what funding comes to us next year. Um, this is a projected of a cost of living increase of 3.94% for next year. Um, right now, the legislative analyst office is telling us to aim at 2%. So we we might see some differences as that goes through, and you'll see some models or some examples of that come first interim. But, you know, as we err on that side, I think at least for the next two years, this this saves this saves us from going into a qualified or a negative budget. Are we able to shift any current year general fund items to supplemental and concentration funding that would impact 23-24? 
Um, we we can't, unfortunately, because we do need to follow in with those goals. Um, and we could revise the LCAP if we needed. We to. we can, but we have to go through some you know committee it's a processes. Yeah, process. it's, it, it very much is, and so we we need to look at that. Really, it would be for how the LCAP and and I'm going to defer to Superintendent Lucci Garcia because um, there that process is starting for 24 25 is going to be coming up pretty soon, and I think that's where we start looking at how can we best utilize these supplemental and concentration fundings. And I think that's even part of what um, some of the possible savings could be um, as we look at if we are at a TK-8 model that really spreads those grade levels, uh, the need for some of those additional staff. And like we talked about some of those electives throughout our district, which is we very much are a district-wide, um, both a title and um, you know a supplemental and concentration district. So that's where we start looking at how can we move some of those things into the LCAP as a district-wide model. Um, I'm not really sure when the discussions start for that, though, but we wouldn't recognize those things until 24, 25, 25, 26. Yeah, so the discussions um, would, I ultimately wanted to have gotten them started by now. Um, typically, we haven't started until December or so, but I wanted to get things started earlier this year. Um, but here we are in November. And so my goal would be to get um, at least get to campuses and get to the student voices and hear what the students are saying um, and then hold our community engagement and then bring out bring some information back to um, our principals to work with their staff, um, to work with um, our, our parent committee as well. So, I mean, it's absolutely a huge process. And um, if, I don't know if you recall, but last year um, when I formed the parent um, advisory committee, uh, one of the rules is to update. I said rules because it's like one of the one of the um, requirements um, of having the PAC is to inform the board about what what decisions or ideas the PAC is coming up with. So um, that will continue to happen so that the board will be informed about where, um, you know, our students and our families and our community and our staff is going with um, their interest in programs and that type of thing. And Clerk Brickler, I, I hear your point too. Um, but you know, I think a concern I would have there is if we, you know, obviously we've, we've made some cuts that could extend at least this looming failure to meet our financial obligations, but that means we're just going to be saddling, you know, next year, the year after those students, the people in our seats, whoever it is at that time, you know, if it's several years from now or anybody here, we're asking somebody else to make those hard cuts and somebody else to make that decision. Um, and I think it's incumbent on us to try to make those harder cuts now um, so that we can have the district on solid financial footing and not hoping and praying that, you know, our unduplicated count is high enough to keep, you know, certain funds going. Yeah, I mean, I'm not afraid to make hard cuts. I just, I think that we've caught the community off guard, even though there's been talk about TK-8 since the budget committee days. Um <clears throat> I just, I've heard some really good ideas tonight between maybe there's a way to give people both of, both of the things they want. Maybe there's a way to fund this with one TK-8 um, in elementary and a conference of middle school. Maybe there's a way to shift the grade spans. I um, It's a nearly impossible task to try to um, save money and give people the things that they want, but I I think it's worth trying to pursue. So I, I think I think that we can have both of those things, right? We can we've we can make some hard choices, but let's be well informed about what what people want, what people um, um, want for their kids, and um, I mean I, I am I'm afraid that some yeah you know, that the, the middle school we've we've heard some negative talk about the, the enrollment numbers going down and whether or not this is going to be a viable option, but I. I also think we're going to lose people if we close the conference of middle school. I wish I had better data to work with about knowing what the outcome would be. I think it's fair to say we will, we will lose people either way, no matter how we decide um, that there, there will be impacts um, no matter what we do. You know, even if one of these other ideas was to, was to work. But um, are there any additional questions on the material that was presented? Trustee Ross, can you hear us okay? Do you have any other questions? 
Um, thank you so much for asking. I really appreciate it. Um, I do have questions, but I think, however, it's probably a great time to get to discussion and motions. Yep. Okay. Okay. And I've been reminded that according to our bylaws, um, we're supposed to make a motion to extend our meeting past 10 p.m. and it's 10:30, so we've gone a little bit past that. With that, uh, does President Holt, I move that we uh, extend our meeting uh, this evening. I'll Pass. second, and I'll do the roll call vote. Um, Trustee Grigsby. Yay. Trustee Ross. Aye. President Holt. Aye. Vice President Wedge. Aye. Clerk Brickler, aye. Aye. So, with that being said, is there a motion? This is Vice President Wedge and just what uh, we've heard tonight and what I've kind of laid out on the floor, I think we're going to be forced to make a decision in a couple of years, no matter what. And I think President Holt made a, um, a great point that um, this is something that we should be doing now to get the district in a, uh, you know, out of, you know, out of our current uh, financial situation. So the next ones that take over, they don't have to make the decisions like we've had to make when we first came on. So um, I move to make a motion to um, to go to implement a district-wide TK-8 program at, uh, in the district. I'll second that. All right, there's a motion on the table. Uh, to move to a district-wide TK-8 implementation. So moving into the debate now on that. Um, if, um, you know, if, if there are three trustees who um, are willing to support the idea of TK-8 district-wide, um, I don't know what the best model is, but there there is a way to activate three of our schools that already have attendance boundaries drawn that are well established and three schools that already have playgrounds and don't need that addition. If we were to utilize just one suggestion, I, I think that the, this is something I don't feel prepared to um, decide upon, but just wanted to offer that alternative that Rock Creek, Auburnell and Sky Ridge, um, there's pros and cons either way, whether you choose the North Central South sites or whether you work with what's already kind of well established in our community that doesn't require additional expense and additional change. So just something for consideration. And if you, I feel like if we wanna discuss that a little bit further even this evening, if there's a motion on that, maybe we could discuss it just a little bit. Greater. I just wanted to clarify that okay. um, when the motion was made, it didn't indicate which three schools. Understood. Um, now we we have three schools open, so I think, it, you know, it's. And we've been discussing to be assumed. right so we're, we're not talking about you know opening up the other two sites i think and i don't think that was part of the motion that was made no that's correct so and to to, to that point i you know i think um there's there's certainly room for conversation there um and, but it's not part of the motion that was made um so if you want to discuss that further you know, you're certainly welcome to make a motion. Maybe there could be a little bit of discussion debate to that point. Um, but... um, I mean, I think I've made it really clear tonight that I'm somewhat skeptical about whether um, this projected savings of $470,000 will come to fruition and whether the move to TK-8 at three sites is the the best um, choice for our district. I think these are incredibly complex decisions and I think there are other options that still deserve to be explored. So, I mean, tonight I, I um, it would not be my choice to make our district TK-8 um, um, across the board, but I was just trying to offer another, if, if, if there's this pol political will to go TK-8, that there are other ways it could be implemented that might be worth consideration since we're really focused on reducing cost um, that doesn't require, you know, modifications to sites, playgrounds, 
um, <laughs> and allows, I don't know if the current attendance boundaries still work. They're just, they're well established in our community that we still hold the Rock Creek, Auburnell and Sky Ridge attendance boundaries. I don't know if our population has shifted or changed at all. I haven't seen the update from the demographic study. Just something to consider, but I think that these are all incredibly complex and I, I, I really think that further study would be helpful. I don't feel um, prepared to, I've tried so hard to come up with a solution and I haven't been able to come up with, with one that's optimal. And it's, it's not something that one trustee can do. It's a community process to, identify the best solutions. And, and Clerk Berkler, uh, this is President Holt again for interpreters. Uh, you know, that what what you raised is something that I've, I've been wrestling with too. And would would that option work? Um, I mean, even tonight, I've been making notes, pro and con, um, the suggestion that you raised. Yeah. Um, but it's, we've got to make a decision that it's going to be the good decision in five years and in 10 years and in 15 years. And Evie Kane is a larger facility. It's got a lot more opportunities there, um, much greater ability to support the, the community. If the enrollment continues to decline, um, you know, down, down the road, it could be that we're looking at closing additional sites. And it may be the next trustees in 10 years that are looking at that option. Um, but it would probably be detrimental to the community to lose the Evie Kane site um, from the district. So well, we haven't lost the Rock Creek site. I mean, I, I'm just making the point that we haven't moved to, um, you know, dispose of any of the properties that we hold. So. Right. I, it's also been two months since school started. No, I understand. I'm just saying um, I've thought about that, too, that that there there are absolutely, you know, some benefits to the E.B. Kane campus being a larger campus, having the best gym in our district that. Um, has specialized science classrooms. It has it has a lot of um, you know there's there's special things about that campus that other campuses would not have. I I I certainly believe that moving to like Rock Creek, Auburnell, and Skyridge would be the comfortable choice. Um, I think that, and it's very tempting because it would be the comfortable choice, and I don't think it would be the best choice for the community. Like I said, looking at five years, looking at 10 years. Um, if I could just make, if I could look at myself and make the, what I thought was just the comfortable choice, I, I would absolutely do it. But I don't know that the comfortable choice is the best choice. And, and I hope that makes sense. So. I think it's, this is clerk. Um, Trustee Grigsby, I apologize. Um, I, oh, okay, I'll, for a minute. Um, I think it's also important to kind of remember that we already did discuss this last year, um, not only about closing E.B. Kane, but a, a few of the other choices and options. And I do believe that we voted them all down. So I think that's something to really emphasize tonight, that it was on the board and we chose not to. This was one of the ones that we didn't vote on last year. It was put off because of how big one decision was at one time. We chose to hold it off for the year. It's now the year. So I think it's very important for us to, to keep that in mind. Trusted, Grisby, that's a great point. We did go through those. We, we wrestled with these in January and February at great length. And then we ruled out certain options. And when we decided to maintain the comprehensive middle school, um, it was with the understanding that we may be discussing moving it to a K-8 model, or TK-8 model rather, along with the rest of the district. Um, this is Trustee Ross. And I just wanna remind us that we actually did, I know it was two separate LEAs, but we did offer to bring Alta Vista to Evie Kane and it was, it was a hard no. Um, mm. And my question is, can, can I make a motion to approve the FTE reductions while retaining our current model? Is that a motion that I could make? Mr. President Holt, I, I don't believe so. Cause that on its own, I don't think was something that we 
um, a agendized, but also as you know, to, to just only reduce staff. Um, I think that would be a different conversation. Um, but that's kind of what we're doing, right? Correct me if I'm wrong. That's that's kind of where our budget went was to reduce staff. There, there's there's I think more to it though, and also as was described by CBO and the interim superintendent, it's not it's not that easy to just cut the staff the way it's currently put together. You know, with the with the different periods and all the rest, um, it's just kind of apples and oranges um, applying that across the different sites. Okay. I think Thank she you. can make the motion. I don't know that that there will be support for it, but I mean, I think it's the it's it's trying to get to our goal tonight, right? Is really that we we need to reduce costs in order to remain solvent. So it's I'm fine. hearing you say that you don't think that the pathway that you've described here is possible with maintaining the comprehensive middle school and the two elementaries. Cutting FTE is not on the agenda tonight. That's all I'm saying is. The, the motion has the, yeah. to be about the agenda item. Yeah. So yeah, the the agenda item isn't even just the necessarily the how, which is part of that, right? But the we would be moving to a TK model. So that's what's agendized tonight, not staff cuts. Okay. Okay. Thank you. But also, isn't it just part of the issue? It wasn't just the three FTEs. It was the three FTEs switching it over to from unrestricted to restricted because of the change to TK. That was why it was feasible to see the, <clears throat> the change in title is a, is a good way to word it. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm still struggling with the idea that some of those cuts couldn't be achieved with our current model with you know, al aligning maybe, maybe a slightly more simplified middle school elective schedule or some way to, to be creative about aligning um, staffing and student numbers um, so that there could be some of those reductions and to also use, shift some of the FTE as has been proposed. I think that there's, I think there are some ways to give that a try. It, it, it gets to the same goal of reducing cost. Or, or can, we a, can we ask for more information about what that might look like? And we, we can always make new requests, right? So we can always make that request. Um, it's certainly something we can do. Um, I mean, couldn't there be a motion about whether, um, um, uh, I'm trying to think of how to word it. Um, I, I think what I'm, well, Trustee Ross, this is your idea, so I should let you, I should <laughs> let you speak. Well, I'm not sure how to speak it. I'm just, I'm on the same page, Trustee Ross. I'm on the same page, um, Clerk Brickler, and the fact that I, I do believe that this is still possible. If we if we lost 53 students, we lost 53 students, whether we have a middle school or whether we have three different schools. So I, I'm having a hard time wrapping my head around this. So I'm not sure how to even pose it in a correct correct question because I, I don't see how it how it's not relevant to both structures, whether we're TK through eighth or middle school and elementary schools. I'm just having a hard time with that. So if you can come up with something, I would I would totally support it. <laughs> Um, so I, let's see here. Uh, let's... No, sorry, disregard. Why don't we know how much it would cost for that if they needed to gain to be able to take away? It's, we can't have yeah. that. No, we can't have it back and forth. But um, I, I actually had asked a question, for example, about what would it cost to add two playgrounds? That's a piece of, that was one of my questions. 
that I hadn't asked yet because I'm trying not to just assail you with questions. I had the chance to meet with the interim superintendent earlier this week and ask a lot more detailed questions. Do we have an estimate of what uh, playground? Well, yeah. I, it's, yeah, a, yeah, I have, yeah. it's a question of mine. Well, we, well just to, to her point, though, we're kind of in the debate stage, you know, now, so it's supposed to be more okay. us kind of asking these, but yes. And so, excuse me, ma'am, excuse me, ma'am, it, it's not time for public comment right now. Thank you. Um, generally speaking, you know, um, and I tried to look up, you know, some recent examples of people who have put like playgrounds in and some of my own personal experience in playground installation. Um, and I think if for the two playgrounds and if we're doing them simultaneously and of course assuming that some of the site work would would be accomplished um you know with the ESSER funding um as restricted funding i'm i'm thinking we're going to be somewhere in the neighborhood of 300 to 500 thousand dollars so and to clarify though the I'm sorry, I can't hear you, President Holt. Thank you. So to clarify, though, the $470,000 savings that are being discussed are annual year-over-year -year savings to the general fund. Correct. Right. So that's every year going forward, not a one-time savings. Correct. Okay. I would, I would add, though, that um, even though it's a use of restricted funds, we always need those restricted facilities funds, right? Like I remember one time CDO Leslie said, if you need to replace a roof, that could be a $2 million expense. So, so it's not that um, that we shouldn't be actively working to conserve those dollars as well, even though they're restricted. Correct. And should we ever move forward also with, you know, the sale of the surplus properties that could also backfill some of those funds as well. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm going to try to make a motion here. Um, uh, uh, um, I move that we um, table the item so that we can learn more about whether some of these staff related cost savings can be realized in our current model. I'll second that. Thanks for bearing with me while I take notes. And to that point, uh, if we do go past, you know, and getting into the next month, we've been advised that we likely wouldn't be able to make this change happen in the next school year. You know, at least with the facilities, they wouldn't be ready. So we'd be pushing it out another year. So I'm hopeful that wouldn't be the case. I, I mean, I, I don't want, I, I want to, I, I want to stay on our timeline. We, I know that we need to be solvent. So I, I don't take that lightly. So I, I understand that you're hopeful. Um, but that, 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 I think you pointed out to you earlier that hope isn't getting us there. So with that, is there any further debate on the motion to table? All right. Clerk Brickler, uh, would you conduct a roll call vote then for the motion to table? Okay. Um, Trustee Grigsby. Nay. Trustee Ross. Aye. President Holt. Nay. Vice President Wedge. Nay. Clerk Brickler, aye. And is there additional debate on the motion put forth by Vice President Wedge to move to a district wide TK8 model? Being none, Clerk Brickler, would you please call the roll? Okay. Trustee Ross. Nay. President Holt. Aye. Vice President Wedge. Aye. Clerk Brickler, nay. Trustee Grigsby. Aye. 
And the motion carries three to two. We can take a break. Okay. Oh. Very well. So. Moving then to item 12A, annual enrollment review from the business office. Thank you. Um, so this um, isn't a full presentation where our, um, um, I'll get up and talk about um, enrollment updates since this is um, really just, um, I'm sorry, this is CBO Leslie. I forget that every time. Um, enrollment update as to where we stand from our enrollment information date as of October 5th. Um, so in the attached, um, you'll see information that was collected. We are still in the process of certifying. So that is our sites are going through and um, making sure that everything is accurate as it was reported. Then this gets forwarded to the state of California um, in which then our enrollment is certified. Um, as a reminder, as we um, talked about, this is not only just where we capture our enrollment. Excuse me, could you please speak a little slower? I'm having a really oh, hard sorry. time with the echo. I don't factor in the echo. Um, this is not only where we receive our enrollment numbers that um, we certify and report to the state of California and receive a certain funding from. Uh, this is also our capture date for our unduplicated students as well. So that's also another factor that we are reviewing. Um, this is how we obtain our funding for, again, supplemental concentration and also many other grants and title funding. In the second slide of this informational, um, and I know in years past, we have really pointed out areas of growth or areas of reduction in enrollment by grade level. Um, I've went ahead and circled um, a couple of the grade levels in red. So um, we can see that we actually have an increase um, in the ones that aren't circled. So with the expansion of some of the ages of transitional kindergarten, as well as us offering some additional combination class, um, we've increased by about 17 students. Um, we have declined at uh, kindergarten and first. Um, we've increased um, at second through fifth, and we see our larger declines in sixth and seventh grade. Um, Sabia Leslie, may I ask? Yes. The way I understood that you could, there's two different ways you could read this. So one, you could say, okay, um, in one year in kindergarten, we had 137 students. Mm -hmm. The subsequent year, we had 130. So there, there has been a decrease in the number of overall kindergartners. But I thought there was also kind of a way of looking at, um, there are different size groups, you know, just like the way that like the patterns in which babies are born. And so mm -hmm. I understood that we used to look at it often as, um, in 22, 23, you look at the kindergartners, there were 137, and then they would grad, not graduate, but be promoted to first grade the following year. So it actually went from 137 to 147. So there was actually an increase in that class. And, and, and kind of like following the cohort. Yes, that is, and that is how we make projections, which is the cohort survival method. So however, when we look at just enrollment flat on, are we increasing or decreasing either by grades or by sites? It just gives us a general of typically we see about X amount of, let's just say kindergartners. Um, and this year we're seeing 100 and, and my glasses, 130, let's say. So then next year's cohort survival, that 130 would be the ones that would then roll forward. So that's where we start. Um, that's kind of like our early flag to where we may see decreases as they move forward um, throughout. So kind of like you're, you're exactly like you're saying, like a bubble. Um, in a ways, and we have had bubbles throughout, um, smaller and larger. However, if if it serves, um, this 130 would then be a, an even lower class size for second grade next year or for first grade next year, for example. So this gives us um, um, just, just an idea of where we have 
um, increased or decreased just by grade level, which is typically um, how this has been given. Um, the last slide, um, in the past and in, in looking at this, it had looked at individual sites. This year, obviously, it's a little bit different um, as it's kind of a, a transition year, um, as some would have said, with the changes of the dependent charter possibly affecting our school district, Auburn Union School District enrollment, and also the consolidation of Rock Creek Elementary School. So while you see um, enrollment per site, it's obviously going to be vastly different. So it's kind of notated. So um, Auburn Elementary previous year at 286 enrollment at our enrollment date of that year um, to 547 um, is not a giant increase in our overall district enrollment, but is related directly to um, additional students primarily closer to that campus from Rock Creek. And then also the increase at Sky Ridge, um, also from the consolidation of Rock Creek and other factors as well. And this is just the information on our current status of enrollment as of October 5th. Yeah, I just have a question too. Uh, on those increases, are, are those uh, from out of district or other students just coming in starting with us? Um, or was Altavistic included in the previous numbers? Um, the previous numbers, uh, thank you for that. Um, sorry, CBO Leslie again. Um, previous numbers of years past, we did, um, AltaVista was separate as we reported it. So they weren't really wrapped into those numbers. Um, we've really seen a, a variance in where students have come from. As you can see, we had a 17 student increase um, just in TK. So projecting those will move forward. That's fantastic. Um, we have seen um, a few come in. Um, we've seen... Um, some people that have moved into the district. Um, we just, it's been really kind of a mixed bag as to where we've seen them from. In fact, um, because of our um, compaction at some of the grade levels, we have had to um, decline um, exterior district students coming in to those particular grade levels, where, as we've had others that we've been able to readily accept. Okay, so, so to clarify though then, so some of these, um the increase in enrollment, some of that is due to Altavista students coming into the other sites. Thank you. I'm also going to add that some of the inter-district transfers um, for some of our surrounding districts were denied this year because they are impacted. Are there any additional questions on that? Or... Okay, moving to 12B, the site accessibility scoping report. Thank you. Again, um, just an informational item that's attached. Um, we had um, had the uh, scoping document brought up for um, numerous reasons under the um, ESSER program, looking at how we may be able to deliver shade structures as lined out in our ESSER 3 COVID funding plan. Um, this gives us an idea of areas that would need to be addressed in order to put items onto these campuses. Um, it gives us a little bit of a better idea, not only for shade structures, but any other future improvements that we wanna make in those areas that could um, be possibly handled or things that we may wanna look out for in the future. Um, so this is just a basic report. There's um, no current fiscal impact on this. Um, just for your information, um, this is the report that we ended up coming up with from there. So you can see that there um, gives us some ideas of placement of shade structure and um, again addresses that due to the small size of the project, we may be able to qualify for um, only going for about 20% of the total cost of the project in accessibility upgrades, which um, would hopefully lower um, the total project cost overall. Is there any further discussion on that? Okay, moving forward, um, item 12C, the update on the Plaza Resource Conservation District Grant. Um, thank you, uh, CBO Leslie again. Um, I know that I had um, was able to update the board uh, via email that I had been approached um, in regards to a possible grant um, with the Placer Resource Conservation District. 
Um, this would not be a grant that the district would be accepting. It's not a grant to us. It's a grant that um, the PRCD is applying for specifically, and we would essentially be looking at being a partner agency um, with them. Their focus was a couple of different areas. Um, they also, um, but they're really excited about the possibility of applying for this grant, um, listing the Rock Creek Community Garden as one of its possible sites of utilization. Um, should that be the case, and they are successful with this grant, um, it would allow them to come in and do um, a major amount of rehab to the community garden, engage in additional planting. Um, they would maintain the garden. Um, they would pay for utilities for the garden. Um, and then they would be able to offer um, community programs, instruction, and also utilize some of the uh, goods from the uh, garden. It's They've already partnered with and are working with numerous agencies in town, but then, of course, donations to such places as, um, you know, the food, the food closet, the gathering in, um, Boys and Girls Club, they already partner with, um, just various uh, things in nature. So this really would give a, a good a great community opportunity and be something that we could partner with without having to fund and continue an improvement of a site that we have and, and a, a resource that, you know, is fantastic out there. Um, so this is just an information that they're still looking at going forward with that. Um, they sh said they should know um, somewhere around January. They were hoping December. They think it may be January. If they are successful with that, um, then we would bring that information to the board. Again, we don't have to accept a grant or have a board motion for that because we're not applying for it. So it would really just be what those facilities use agreements look like as we go forward. Uh, just in terms of transparency, I was approached to be one of the team members on this grant. So I, as a, oh, more nice. as like an, as an individual, I added my name to it to try to support it. Nice. Great. That's all. Thank you. Okay. And moving then to item 12D, and is there any public comment on 12D? No. <clears throat> okay. So uh, discussing the current district vision statement, uh, the current statement is, let me scroll back to it. We stand together to cultivate the potential of all students in a global society. Um, feedback I've gotten from the community and my personal position, um, it's a little bit lofty. Uh, and uh, discussing you know, the global society aspect, I don't think that's what the vision should be. Uh, I think we should be moving that a little bit more tailored towards uh, American society, American citizens, um, in line with what our oath is, uh, which is to the Constitution of the United States. So um, I'd like to visit this um, in the future uh, as an action item um, to adopt a new vision statement. Um, this is Trustee Ross. Oops, sorry. Um, I do want to just reinstate that we spent a lot of money rebranding our district and that came from a recent rebranding that we did within the last it was right when we came on board so it might have been three years ago and a lot of community members were involved I was there as a community member and so this was not a it was accepted by the board but it was actually brought to us by the community so I just want to make that known trust you Ross and, and I hear that um and I think uh what we saw last year, about a year ago this week, um, was that that was one of the contributing factors to the change in board um, composition. Um, things like the division the statement, um, the, the next item we're gonna discuss and some others, kind of the, the direction um, that the district was headed uh, in terms of politics. So, sorry, Clerk Brickler. You're... Just, I didn't realize that there would be something controversial about referencing a a global society because of how interconnected our world is, how, um, you know, we, I mean, I understand like you've served abroad, like we, we, we are all very interconnected as um, citizens on this planet. And so I didn't foresee that that would be um, a controversial addition to the vision statement. And so I'm just wondering, I mean, if, is it, one possibility, if, if that's something that you're not um, in support of, is just to end 
with potential of all students. We stand together to cultivate the potential of all students. We don't have to further, you know, um, explain. Yeah, I, I, I very well could be open to that. Um, I, I, but we, we can't take action on it, obviously, tonight. But, right. You know, something like that, I, I think, be open to it. And uh, I know I certainly will think about that um, after we leave this evening. Because I think we do agree we want to help cultivate the potential of all students. So. <clears throat> Is there further discussion on that one? Okay. Nope. Moving to 12E then, was there public comment on that one? Okay. So the diversity, equity, or inclusion statement, or the way we have it in our board policy is the diversity, inclusion, and equity statement. Um, you know, obviously we discussed this a year ago. Trustee mm -hmm. Ross, I promised we'd talk about it one day. I think he, uh, we, we talked about this back in January. Um, so in recent years, it's been a real trend among at academia and corporations to virtue signal their support for social justice causes by adopting these statements. Um, and, and I think it'd be easy to dismiss this as virtue signaling um, because it doesn't provide guidance on how these goals will be achieved. It mentions a whole bunch of progressive buzzwords. Um, and, and, and I don't know that the people who supported it or voted for it kind of gave it much more consideration than that, uh, or consider the underlying assumptions that this statement um, requires. So last uh, last November, Trustee Ross, you described equity as, um, as an example of equity, as providing strawberries to a class and giving apple slices to a student with an allergy or who, who couldn't eat strawberries. Um, you know, and that's, that, that's a nice, clean example, um, but it does illuminate what what I think, uh, what I see is one of the most glaring problems with the idea of equity, and that's it is based on outcomes. Um, equity is a principle concerned with redistributive fair outcomes, um, but determined by group um, or measured by group, not necessarily by the individual. Um, and it's a, generally according to immutable characteristics such as race, gender, ethnicity, et cetera. Um, and then the person who determines what is equitable is the individual that group with authority. So it. I think it takes a special kind of hubris to proclaim that any institution can provide equality and outcome. Um, and I don't think that that is something that the people of Auburn wanted us to support um, in our school. So um, moving through the statement. It, Do you uh, mind if we talk about the origin of the statement, just um, the work that was done to develop it? I think that would be a great yeah. idea. Let, let's, yeah, we, we, let, we, let's circle let's back, it back to it. Yeah, let's, let's put a pin in that. So, you know, I, I'm going down. The, the statement that talks about um, no school can possibly hope to provide a barrier or let's see here. Oh, uh, that's my words. Let me get back to your words. Um, let's see here. Student staff and stakeholders have a legitimate expectation to have a barrier free learning environment, which nobody can guarantee a barrier free environment. We want to do what we can to try to to get there right that we're not putting roadblocks up for people to learn. Um, but flipping on its head there, we, it's, uh, no school can possibly hope to provide a barrier free learning environment, just as all of us are unique individuals, barriers and challenges in everyone's unique learning journey is unique to that individual. So rather than suggesting it's the duty of some authority, such as this board to remove those obstacles from the TK to the eighth grade, um, it would provide a much better service to help students develop school skills to identify and overcome challenges and obstacles as they go. That's what's going to carry them through life. So this statement also serves as an acknowledgement that a history of bias, prejudice, and discrimination has produced predictability of learning outcomes based on a number of intersectional identities, such as race, gender, class, cognitive ability, and more. Um, that statement, too, that line also denies the agency of the individual. Uh, discriminatory laws and policies in our nation's past have absolutely denied millions of Americans um, and enslaved people and others the free exercise of their rights, of their natural rights, but that's not where we're at today. And it's wrong to tell children that the reason they aren't doing as well or that they won't do as well or that they can't do as well uh, as others is because of historical discrimination by an oppressor group. And this whole oppressor oppressed narrative has no place in our public schools, in our public schools. So a free society isn't equitable and an equitable society is not free. 
So I'd love to hear about the origin of the statement. Wow, President Holt. Um, so the, the origin of the statement was actually that the community asked us for it. And um, so some of our board members went to a year and a half worth of training and worked with um, board members from all over the all over the United States. Mostly they were from California and all together in a group composed um, ideas. This equity statement was actually um, not taken, but it was modeled after CSBA's equity statement because they recommended that districts enhance their own um, vision statements by adding an equity statement. Um, that's that's the origins of it. However, I think you have completely taken it out of context. Um, I highly, highly recommend that you definitely do some education on this because although things have changed, we in school, school is the great equalizer. School gives us the opportunity to equalize our students so that they can become community members. However, because some students, some students have to think about food. They go to school so hungry, and I understand we provide food because that's an equity piece. Um, some students are so hungry that they can't even think about their homework. Some students have been um, going through really a lot of traumatic trauma that we don't need to bring into this um, school board meeting, but it has hurt them so bad that they have a hard time learning. We see it in the behaviors of our students right now. Our students are acting out like we've never seen before, especially after COVID. Equity means we get them whatever it is they need so that they can adjust in that equal sliding system. Recently, we had some issues at Auburn Elementary. If we did not provide equity, what this student needed at that time, we could be going through a lot of, of legal actions. So we're already providing equity to our students. Our superintendent just told us that each school will get a SPED program that they need. That's equity. That's not equal. If it was equal, then every school would have the same program. I run the drama clubs. I run drama club at Sky Ridge. I run drama club at Auburn Elementary. I've never been paid, not a penny. I do this out of the kindness of my heart. So you're gonna think that I'm gonna do this out of the kindness of my heart at, at all three schools because I can? Like that's equality. You cannot, you cannot tell me that all three schools are going to be equally laid out. Each three schools, is going to be given the program that they need for their students. That is equity. It's taking the barriers that we can, that we have control over, and making it easier for that student to step up on the equal level. So I'm really sorry that you don't understand equity or diversity, um, but I really highly suggest you do some research on it. Ross, I would suggest that you don't appreciate how it's being applied in education across the country um, at the elementary, high school, or college levels. Um, mm -hmm. And so I would also encourage you to educate yourself on how it's being applied, where we see advanced programs cut from other schools in the name of equity, where we see schools that uh, discriminate on who they admit in. Uh, we just saw the Supreme Court come down on Harvard, right, because they were discriminating against Asian students for how they got into school. So when we see- also seeing the attorney general go after our, our Rockland, our own Placer County, off our own Placer County school. We have the attorney general coming off of because of things that are happening to LBGTQ students. So they're getting sued from both sides. I'm not saying that our school is using equity and that it's not. So our we're probably going to have to agree to disagree on this topic. I mean, I'm yeah, not saying that we can't have a debate, yeah, but um, yeah. President Holt, what is your suggestion? What What is your proposal about the about the statement? Well, my proposal would be that we uh, actually, and even before I get to that, Clerk Brickler, did you have any more you wanted to add about the origin of it? Because you you had started to say something. It was just that um, 
our California School Boards Association led a training. The prior superintendent, trustees. It, it was it was a it was an involved. It was a um, an investment on our part as a board. There was a financial cost. There was a, a lot of time dedicated to this, and um, I I I support this statement. It, it, it is clear that you do not, and you have the majority. So let us know what your what plans you have for um oh, i don't know what you're proposing are you proposing eliminating it are you proposing modifying it what what is your course of action yeah so um just as trustee ross pointed out we're we're providing services to students doesn't matter who they are doesn't matter what what where they came from what their name is what they look like we provide those students our staff provides those services so i don't think um and i don't think our community um you know, not just the community that gets involved and, and goes to the workshops, but the community in Auburn, um, that they don't think we need to embrace this political ideology. It's all wrapped up. I think even if we disagree on the merits of it, Trustee Ross, I think we can agree that there's a lot more when you see like a DEI statement, there's more to that than exactly what's on there, right? There's, there's a lot that goes behind it. There's certainly kind of a political movement um, or probably a bit bigger political movement. So I would suggest that um, I would like to revisit this um, as an action item, um, and my recommendation would be that we strike the statement. Well, this is uh, Vice President Wedge. Um, you know, I re reviewed it as well, and uh, you know, I know it's been discussed a little bit. And at the time, a lot of these uh, DEI statements were being introduced in schools and other institutions. It was really politically driven, and that is one thing that um, you know that I really stood by is that. Uh, Anything politically driven, any political agenda does not belong in our school systems. And so I would have to agree with uh, uh, President Holt, and I would like to see this uh, um, statement striked as well. Well, I, I would just push back and say that you know politics just means in public, right? And so or yep. public, and so obviously there's going to be politics in the school school district. But I think you know maybe to your point, you know whether it's trendy or something else, but obviously politics has to influence what we do. True. Um, it's so interesting to hear your perception that this is politically driven because um, my understanding of it is that it's about acknowledging um, that we are going to do our best as a district to provide whatever kids need to be successful. And we're going to do whatever it takes. So um, I, it's clear that we, you see it as political. I do not see it as political. I see other statements that are made as political. You do not. So um, you guys have the numbers. So if you choose to revisit it at a future meeting, then then you can do so. So looks like let's wrap up that discussion. Moving to 13A, board direction requests, an update on requests. <laughs> this is interim superintendent Luchi Garcia. Um, so the board request. Oh, here we go. Um, so the board gave direction to produce a survey of school preference. So we did that, and we um, got that out to families and community members. Um, direction was given to show a simple breakdown of how much we need to cut from our budget and where we are with cuts made to date. And actually, CBO Leslie got that to me the same evening as the last board meeting, and I did send that out to the board via email, and then and then we addressed it again this evening. Uh, direction was given for me to look into concerns regarding Auburn Elementary and see how we can provide more support. Um, so that has been done as well, and it's ongoing. I am working with Principal Morris um, to ensure that um, she's getting some processes in place and that she has um, uh, the plan and the support to do so. Sorry, could you could you elaborate? You said that the main support you've provided is in developing processes? Um, actually, Principal Morris is developing processes and I'm and I'm working as her thought partner and someone who is kind of overseeing um, how she's progressing and um, if she needs something or some resource uh, and then I'm able to help her get that or decide if we can. Do you feel like the back and forth communication is working really well? Do you feel like there could be some 
alternate method of meeting one-on-ones, weeklies, um, teachers, whatnots? Um, so Principal Morris and I, we had worked out a schedule, um, a six to eight week schedule where um, she was going to do some things and then we were going to check in and then that type of thing. Um, and then uh, conference week came and she was out and then um, crunch time for this, uh, you know, the the TK model for you all. So um, she and I did check in. Uh, we had a principal meeting was that yesterday? Yes, on Tuesday yesterday. Um, but we were checking in on kind of our PE VAPA schedule more than where we are in that cycle. Um, we will resume that discussion and see where we are. We do have a document that I can monitor and see um, what she's entering and what she's doing. Um, she's created some training and um, like some cycle of support for um, certain staff members to um, help her obtain her first goal. Um, and so when I check in with her, you know, we'll see where she's at with that and what support she needs there. I, I hope that that turns out to be helpful. Um, it sounds like we've given her a new way, a new document she has to track or a new, um, no, no, I, I didn't give her the document. She, she and I created it together. So we, um, she actually had the ideas and I met with her and she's implementing her own ideas. So I did not take something new to her to do. Um, that's not, that's not really my leadership style, to be honest. Um, while I can, um, make hard decisions and, implement things that are difficult it's more my style to collaborate and get people's ideas and so if some if i'm going to help someone be successful in something they've got to build it right they may need some thought partnering or maybe you know actually let's move a different direction that could happen but really it's not the first thing that we do we sit down we collaborate um, principal morris had her own ideas and her own plan to implement she shared that with me and then we set it out we laid it out together um, with her ideas so i just want to make that very clear it might sound like it's something that i'm doing but actually this is her plan that we're implementing that she's implementing that i'm supporting her through thank you for the clarification and new requests. This is Trustee Grigsby. Um, I um, I noticed a couple months ago that we had a report. Um, I don't I don't remember if it was a collaboration with Auburn Elementary and um, Auburn PD, but I remember that there was a discussion about transportation and drop offs and pickups. Um, have we? gotten anything from Skyridge yet um or is there plans for it or kind of like um this is and... yeah the, this is where we drop off please don't park here's whatnots this is the red zone please don't drop <clears throat> your child off so I know that uh, Principal Ade has been working with her community. In fact, she called, she and I, so again, another one of those things where we sit together, they have an idea, we thought partner through it, and then they implement. So uh, she and I met um, over some of the issues that had come up. Um, it was a, a, a couple months ago now. Um, and so she um, had an idea to meet with her neighbors the neighborhood and start like some kind of like a, um, a, not really a neighborhood watch, but you know, a neighborhood collaborative type of thing. And so she actually held her first meeting with the neighbors and they were, um, they were happy to be included in a discussion about what they're concerned about and that type of thing. Now, some of the concerns, you know, are concerns that will come about living in a neighborhood with the school and we can't really control some of the, um, the things that, that may be causing concern, but, you know, um, that back and forth conversation about this is what we're concerned about. This is what we're concerned about. So, you know, um, that flow of traffic came up and also watching for people, um, on campus when nobody's here, you know, that type of thing. So, um, Heather and I are working on, um, well, the principals have created their safety plan. Heather and I are working on a new platform to get those safety plans into to support the um, principals and their staff 
in dealing with, um, let's say, emergency situations or drills and that type of thing. Part of the implementation of that plan of that um, platform is to put the safety plans into the platform with the maps and the plans and all the things. Um, but to do that, those safety plans have to be updated. In fact, they have to be updated each year per our request, not per law. Per law, the district plan has to be updated and board approved each year because we have um, less than 2,500 students. So um, that was a lot of story, but I'm trying to give you all of the background so you understand. Um, as the principals revise and revisit their safety plans, some of those um, components will be written in there. And then um, and then I can share that out with the board at that time. But yes, there is work being done. It is slow. And part of that is that, you know, to really build from the ground up, it takes some time. Um, but also because there are other, so many other factors, you know, involved and, you know, with parent conference, parent conference week and that type of thing, you know, things kind of pause for a minute. So parents can come in and, and, and learn about their kids' education. I'd like to add that I was just walking through the um, NPR when Mrs. Aday was holding um, a coffee with the principal event and it ended up being um, a gathering of neighbors. And um, I was asked, you know, I was like walking past, I, I was asked to join and I was really impressed by, um, you know, she had this great conversation with the neighbors. I just really appreciated that she was facilitating that sort of a discussion. Mm -hmm. But I felt like a lot of what I heard was, you know, that it comes down to us as parents. You know, I think it was really the community saying, please slow down. You know, sometimes the streets feel unsafe. Um, sometimes kids are, you know, dropping trash in their yards. And so just, it was just a, a helpful discussion about um, the need to remind our school community to be good neighbors. Absolutely. So I appreciate that Mrs. Aday had that sort of forum. It's really productive. I have another request. I would love to be able to do something district-wide with either all of our students, parents, uh, community members. Um, I love the resource fair <laughs> idea, um, especially if that is too much. I would I would love to be able to do some other kind of concept activity, anything to get all three schools connected together to show that we are uh, one district, not three separate schools. I think like a field day could be fun. I think that would be a phenomenal one. Like yeah. schools put together. Yeah. Somewhere maybe ARD or EV Kane, but one of the sites. I know where we can get a slushy machine. <laughs> That many kids can eat multiple slushy machines. Uh, yeah, it's big. <laughs> but I do. I think especially getting the community together, getting all of the children, all of the parents, all three. Yeah. Well, well, that yeah, with the weather turning. <laughs> Winter Wonderland and a springtime. I have a feeling we'll need a lot of those sort of events. Um in the next year at the TK8 model, like I would love to see the Renaissance Fair continue, but that would require bringing students from three different campuses together. So I think that um, the new model will, you know, it would, it would benefit our students if they were able to interact with one another. Yeah. <clears throat> um, I have two new requests. Um, one is, is kind of an old one. It's I can't remember which meeting it was, but when we discussed the interim superintendent contract, um, we didn't receive the document until, um, you know, it was agendized, but didn't have an attachment on it. And so the attachment has never been provided to the community. And I understood that in order for it to be added to the agenda, I had to make a new request just so that out of transparency, so that the, there would be, the contract would be posted online. Yeah, we, we can't go back and add it to the past agenda. I, I think maybe, are you asking if we can add it to a future agenda or? Oh, I don't know or what the mechanism is. I'm being told that we can't add it back to, because it, was, it wasn't posted, um, you know, within like the time frame of the, it wasn't posted. Um, we had access to it as a board. We took action on it, but it was not made available to the public on our online agenda system. So maybe Kirsten can inform us about what we, the... We can't add it to the old agenda. However, if it, you have a new request, we can always 
update our requests on our next agenda and have it as an attachment there. Attachment for like an information item or something like that? Or just in our update re new requests. If you want a specific oh, okay. agenda item, you can certainly request from Superintendent Luchi Garcia and, and President Holt to have it as an agenda item. Otherwise, we can just add it as an attachment under update on requests. Okay. Or I just want it to be findable because I, I often go back into the board agenda and use this too far if I'm looking mm -hmm. for so like somebody asked me today. There was a misconception in the community that we don't get audited. And I said, no, absolutely, we get audited. It's by an independent firm. If you just go into the board agenda and search audit, it'll come up. So I, I value it being, you know, accessible. And the other thing was, I understand that the, the, the Rock Creek campus was not made available to sports teams. And I'm assuming it's soccer. I think that that's the main sport that's played at that historically at that field. And I know we've talked a lot about wanting to still make the campuses that are um, closed available to the community. We talked about, you know, utilizing the Rock Creek Garden. So I um, wanted to get some clarification about uh, the Rock Creek sports field availability. But I know, I guess that means it's a new request. So I don't know if you yeah, it's a new it. request. So I was I was just going to ask if it's yeah. if it's okay if um, we provide that via email, perhaps yeah, we can get great. something out to the board. Yeah, thank you. So I just want to make sure that um, so I I'm hearing that we're going to email about the field, and the board would like me to put the super the interim contract on as in, um, in the updates, right? Okay. Um, I'm watching for the nodding, the nodding hands. Okay. Yeah, as long um, as it wasn't, you know, as long as legal didn't say we can't for whatever reason. But I'm sure it's all, it's all sus public except for. I don't think there's any problem with that, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I don't think that there is. No. Not that I know of. I mean, I you know, I always like to double check things, but um, no, I, I think it's public. I, and I and I think it just didn't get posted because you had to decide on it and then we had to do the, the thing and then and then it could be that, you know, that's why it wasn't posted on the original agenda. Okay. Um, and then I'm hearing that um, we're, we want to look into um, a community event where we can get the schools together. Okay. Some sort of district event. Okay. Of the idea of the cross district event, but it is a really heavy lift for our staff. And so I'm wondering how that would be accomplished. You know, like it's a great idea, but um, um, I want to be really careful not to burden our staff. So I don't know what kind of resources we might have that would help facilitate an event like that. Like, for example, um, Trustee Ross's Kids of Palooza is this great event, and it isn't just specific to Auburn Union, but it's open to all, you know, families and children in Auburn. But um, that's, I know it's a lot of work. So I'm, I am, um, I'm not sure what the answer is, but I just, the resource fair I know is a ton of work for staff. And, and so I just want to acknowledge that and see if there's a. Well, Trustee Ross has experience. I wouldn't mind helping out. I'd offer also, I mean, especially if it's getting the community together and for the district, then absolutely. If it if it's a matter of volunteering, getting volunteers for it with one um, district supervisor watching, then maybe then maybe that um, or team, uh, team, building. team building. Go go team board. <laughs> I, I I think you know too. If we and also defer to administration, you know I think they'll provide us options within reason for the district, and then hopefully tell us how they can utilize us. That would just be my thought. And then um, just to go back to the um, the safety plan. So um, it, when the safety plans are done, will that set up? And, and I report to the board what the principals have, have put in their plans. Will that be enough for the new request um, to, to, um, to meet the, the request? Almost. Um, I didn't see it come out for the parents. Oh, um, okay. So, so it, it would be nice if that report for. would come out okay, like the guidance you. did for the Auburn Elementary. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for the clarification. Don't park in the red zone. 
<laughs> All right. Are there were there any additional new requests we didn't get to? Trustee Ross, any new requests? Uh, no, thank you for asking. Okay. All right. And with that, it is 1137 and this meeting is adjourned. <laughs>